What's up, my juice lovers? Welcome to the Cold Press Truth Juice Business Podcast. So excited to be posting the newest episode with the incredible Marcus and Tebby. Marcus is one of the smartest people I've ever met. He thinks about juice bars and actually all retail businesses so much more than anyone I've ever met. He's got hundreds of pages of material he's written on the subject. Um, he hasn't published it. He just writes it to get all of his thoughts in order. So I've been talking to him about doing this podcast since this summer. I mean, basically, when I started the Cold Press Truth podcast, Marcus was obviously one of the first people that came to mind of who I'd want to feature on here. So I've been talking to him about this for a while. He's going back and forth about topics and um, what he would like to discuss on it. Uh, we definitely did more preparation for this one than I do for most, and I think it it was good. You know, we really cover a lot of material, but to be honest, we didn't cover all of it, so we'll probably do another one in the future. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Marcus, leave them in the comments below, and I'll try to work them in in a future episode. Of course, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of this content. And as always, the Cold Press Truth Juice Business Podcast is brought to you by Good Nature Products Incorporated, which is my family business that my father started in the 1970s and has since then become the world leader in cold press juice equipment. Uh, Good Nature is the brand that Juice Press and thousands of other juice companies have used to serve the highest quality, the best tasting, the most incredible cold press juice you can make. And also, if you haven't checked out our new machine, the Good Nature M1, which is our new juice press specifically made for making one glass of juice at a time for made-to-order juice, check it out at goodnature.com. Become part of the Good Nature family. And with that, let's get into it. Rolling. Ready start We're ready to start. Yeah. Okay. Start rolling, you're, you're, it's, okay. So it's your show. I'm gonna sit here like a dummy, <laughs> and I'm just gonna let you. Uh, even though I, I talk at this mic no, a lot, so I, you you do the intro and everything, right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't do much of an intro. But Whatever sure. you do. Yeah. Just I'm so I'm here. I'm sitting here. You're right. Barbara Walters, and I'm uh, O.J. Simpson. Are we rolling? Okay, welcome to the Juice Business Podcast. I don't know what episode this is. Maybe seven, I think. <laughs> and we have the infamous, the intelligent, the creative, the infamous. I like infamous. Ins- Usually means like I was a gunfighter at one time. <laughs> kind of, sort of in the juice yeah. industry. In the yeah. juice industry. Um, I'm personally excited for this. I know that I always ask our community, like, who do you guys want to see? On the podcast, who do you want to see speak at JuiceCon? Who do you wow, want to see on the blog? Wow, famous in one industry, guys. You're the only person people ask for. That's crazy. So. <laughs> That's great. I had no idea. Like, I, I appreciate that a lot. I'm not going to in any way let that go to my head because it's a very small accomplishment. I appreciate uh, the accolade, and I assume that it's because I actually accomplished something, and I'm very happy to share it with you. We, we took a lot of time to prep for this. We, we made a content outline a few months ago, and we refined it, and I think that if we can get through the whole... Uh, outline i think that's uh will be very helpful for people yeah we have you sent me a whole long list of topics and i hope we can get through it all i'm gonna, I'm gonna be you you just have to like uh do you, do you mind if he puts any sound effects in here that's too weird for you guys right do you have a yeah, sound effect do... of someone being pushed off a cliff if i talk too much on a subject <laughs> i let, let's not worry about it. let's just <laughs> let's just go with the flow right, see go where it goes okay. um let me see if this chair look we got a timer up there too Oh, nice. So we can see how long we're babbling there for. There we go. I felt like you were like six inches taller than me. I know. That wasn't fair. Hold on. There we go. By the way, I use these for my bookmarks. Oh, nice. Those are I, the I just picked up, cards. I just picked up some more this morning. Wait. Sorry. <laughs> Can't really see them. This is your, This is for the... Is this... um. Uh, recording for a uh, podcast or for video? Yes. So I have a, a video podcast. So I have oh, cool. a YouTube channel called The Cold Press Truth. Where I do kind of like what you do. By the way, you started your own channel. Anyone that wants to check it out. Oh, thanks for the plug. Search uh, Marcus and Tebby on YouTube. I ha- Well, the main channel that I'm promoting right now is I do a show at this podcast studio called The Sherpa and the Schmuck with my friend okay. Ralph. And it's pretty funny. It's not about juice. Yeah. Uh, it's just about uh, life and solving some problems. It's kind of fun. We've been doing that for about a year. Oh, cool. You have and like then, 40 uh, episodes or something. And then what's uh, Good Sugar? Good Sugar is a registered trademark brand that I... 
uh, put into play that I'm writing a business plan around for my uh, next food and beverage project here in New York. Nice. Um, to the development stage. I know that's one thing you're passionate about is trying to convince people that sugar's not evil if it comes from fruit and vegetable, right? Well, I would use it a different word. You know, I, I wouldn't say I'm trying to convince anyone. I, I think I did that 10 years ago. It's not really effective. I, I feel like it's really important when you discover a version of the truth that is helpful to people to try to put it out there and just let it grow on its own. It's not something that I'm here to convince. And I, and I, I think there's a lot of people out there that understand that topic. They understand that fruit and the sugar from starchy vegetables, for example, is vital to our chemistry versus the processed sugar that people have demonized for the right reasons. And I think what's happened in the, uh, the food business is the consumer's confused. They just hear the word sugar and they just mm-hmm. think bad. Yeah. So how do you think, how, how do you turn people around on that? Well, it's interesting because if, you, if you're driving in New York City, you'll see that there's places that sell uh, terrible food and they, they're crowded. So it seems that in certain categories, people don't actually care. Right. You know, there's actually a, a place here called Sugar, and it just sells candy. I mm-hmm. mean, and, and it's crowded. They're, they're a big business. Popular place, yeah. So you, you have to understand is that people's tendency is it's context. Like where they're at or where they're shopping is where they're probably going to care about something. Mm-hmm. So like they'll, people will sit down at 10 o'clock at night and eat too large of a portion of a meal, have a dessert, drink a couple of glasses of alcohol. The, the word sugar is not in their mind. But at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, if they go into a juice mm-hmm. bar... Some for some reason their sensibility is turned on, mm. and that's when they're starting to look at calories and sugar content, and they just want to understand what they're doing. And I don't, I don't think you can teach everyone because not everyone's available for learning. In the juice business, you're dealing with people who are uh, obviously uh, a little bit more conscious about what they're putting into their body. So there's an opportunity to take that particular consumer and give them simple bite-sized knowledge. Right. Yeah. It is. It is weird. It's a big issue, though. Yeah, no, it's a huge issue. Not not just the sugar issue, the whole nutrition issue. I think, mm-hmm. unlike the uh, Mexican food business where you're wrapping a burrito, you don't have to teach people how to eat. They just come in, they order what they like. They're getting some calories. They feel they feel full. When you when you're in the juice business, you're you're you you really do have to explain to a lot of consumers that it's a lifestyle, and you have to educate them on how to use it. There's a lot of uh, intrepidation about so many aspects of what people are doing when it comes to juice and smoothies. And I think that if you um, over-educate people, they just become more confused. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's really just a balance of what is it that I need to tell people that will just get them to buy the product? I'm not gonna, you're not, we're not going to sit and get into molecular uh, chemistry with people mm-hmm. on the floor at a juice bar and you're certainly not going to train your front of house staff to be able to go that deep into a conversation. So you have to really just narrow it down to the to the touch points that get a person to feel relaxed and recognize that at worst juice and smoothies are just really good placebo. Right, because you feel feel better about yeah, yourself. You, you think you're doing something better. It's a huge impact on your chemistry. So I've been eating 100% plant based since January 1st. Oh my God! Don't do it. <laughs> it's been like five weeks. And people keep asking me, like, how do you feel? How do you feel? And I think the biggest thing for me is the almost emotional aspect of just feeling better about myself. You know, it just gives me better mental energy throughout the day, I feel like. Well, you dropped some weight. It looks from the last dropped time I saw weight. you. Your yep. skin's brighter and more clear. So are your eyes. Mm-hmm. Very easy to detect that, especially if you're in the juice business for that. Right. Many years. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, because you watch, you know, for at least six or seven years, I would watch the transformation of people, individual guests that would come into the stores, I would see them transform, you know, mm-hmm. coming in in one condition and changing to something else. And it's really interesting to watch that because the results are very predictable. Right. Yeah, I mean, it just has to, right? Well, there's a lot of circumstances that go into someone changing their, their overall uh, chemistry from using our particular product. Obviously, you have to look at their overall diet, but you made a radical shift in your diet, which was you um, eliminated... Uh, too much animal protein. Mm -hmm. And so just by that one correction, there's going to be a reciprocal improvement in your chemistry. Just that one correction. And I'm sure that by letting go of animal protein, I guarantee you probably incidentally changed five other eating patterns Mm -hmm. that weren't the best eating patterns. Because usually when a person becomes willing to change their 
eating pattern in a radical way, there's usually other things that they do at the same time. Something right. made you say, hey, I got to change my lifestyle. So I'm sure that you're either not eating processed food or eating far less processed food just mm -hmm. because you said, I'm going on a special diet. Is I think correct? consuming less calories for sure. There's like, another one. Yeah. I think that's been the biggest thing for me. Because when you don't have dairy and you don't have meat, you're just kind of automatically consuming less calories. I feel like I'm talking like Anthony Robbins. I'm just like dumping so much like no, data. No, it's, it's good. This is good. You know what? But uh, his method of teaching, it's kind uh -huh. of hard to listen to, but I realize I'm, that... I'm done. I just got to take off my sweatshirt. He, he speaks so fast and so loud that it's almost like it crashes, his, not, his information crashes through your subconscious <laughs> and you pick up something of value. Uh -huh. And I, I feel like the reason I feel so rushed and crammed is I know that we have a lot of topics. So forgive yeah. me for sounding like I'm on Adderall. I'm not. <laughs> it's okay. I think part of this too is the rest of the juicing community wants to just get to know you better. So Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, we I'm an just... okay guy, man. I promise. I'm not doing <laughs> bad things to anybody. Um, and before we move on, I just wanted to read my two favorite postcards. Okay, I think... These are juice press po postcards. Yes, which back in which the day. you do all the writing for, right? I did all the writing. There's yeah. maybe one or two of the later postcards before we canceled the postcard pro program <laughs> that I wrote with my partner who now owns Juice Press, Michael Karsh, great guy. We started to collaborate together. And in the operation of Juice Press, it just got uh, too difficult for us to be able to continue to do passion projects. We were always involved mm -hmm. in the operation. So I, fe I feel like the, uh, the postcard project really did not continue to get the uh, attention that it deserved. But I think it was a very important part of our brand. This is my favorite. And this is one I use as a bookmark in my <laughs> books. Uh, Where's the camera? Okay. It says, coupon, Juice Press Savings Coupon. Save 50% off at any of our competitors' nearby stores. Simply bring this card into any one of their stores and demand an explanation of why their product is half as good as ours. Then receive 50% off of their regular retail prices. Offer valid at participating competitor stores. Not valid with other offers. See limitations and restrictions on their website. <laughs> so, I mean, that's hilarious. Do you, do you think anyone actually tried that? No, I think people got <laughs> it. I mean, I'm sure no one's tried it. I've never heard anything about that. Um, the postcards, what I was trying to do with the postcards at mm -hmm. Juice Press was say something shocking or ridiculous on the front side, and then on the back side... Uh, put a you know uh, uh, one of these bite-sized uh, pieces mm. of about the product and and so it in the beginning the postcards actually the first postcard i did at juice press was a it was a function of necessity i would constantly male guests would come into the store and they would say what do you have that's good for an erection mm. and then i would always crack a joke and then wait for a reaction you know i'd say I'd pick a few obvious jokes but it was something that I think that as I started to get uh, move further away from the front of house, it was an uncomfortable question that guys would be asking female workers, and there was a problem mm -hmm. with that. So the uh, I was working on a business plan at Kinko's, and I just started to doodle. I got distracted, and I made this business card. The front of it was I just hand drew a flaccid penis, and then the headline said, "What makes penis happy?" Mm -hmm. And then on the back side of it, I wrote something that was really serious that I had discussed with my food mentor, a guy named Fred Bishi. We talked a lot about things. Seen him on your videos. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. great. So we wrote this postcard, and I actually had the nerve to print it, and I made a postcard holder in the store, and people would scream with laughter. Like, they were just so shocked that, like, a well-put-together business would have something so irreverent and outrageous. And so I went after, you know, the different topics of that store. You know, I had a postcard that, you know, I think it's something like, why is... Uh, cold pressed juice so expensive. I felt like those things, instead of trying to get staff to understand and be able to articulate these matters, I felt like if I created media around those topics that the customer would find them and then I would have a direct voice to them mm. through the writing. And maybe those are questions they would never actually ask what they're just thinking too. Yeah. Right? Or they, in, I, I just feel like in the health industry, people that shop the health industry, they're not shy. They really just ask every question. I mean, there's obviously people who shop who don't care as much but if you're standing behind the register at a juice bar in new york city you know if 300 people walk up per day 200 of them are going to have to ask you something complicated about the universe the cosmos juice mm. calories right. sugar it's not just gonna be straightforward like hey can i get the number three they're gonna right, have right. to say you know why you know what do you have for uh hair loss what, what do you have for you know um, um, i can't find parking on sundays it just there's always there's always a question or a comment hmm and then my other favorite one is 
drank our juice a real lot and lose like 11 pounds in due time. Show, show it again because you have to look at it. It's obviously horrible grammar <laughs> because that was actually a lot of times the postcards that I made, I made inspired by something that happened right at in okay. the store, right? Uh, you know, and, and on regular programs, if I'm being politically correct, I wouldn't talk about those situations. But here it's, you know, it's a, it's a juice po- podcast. Um, that one came from the store that was on the Lower East Side would get young people who spoke uh, and sort of an inner city language. Mm. And uh, this woman came in and she started talking to one of the staff members while she was looking at this complex refrigerator with all these bottled juices. And she actually spoke like that. She said, I'm looking to lose weight. Uh, like, like, you know, how much weight could I lose? And she actually said something like pounds. that, yeah. 11 pounds. Mm-hmm. And it would just seem funny to me. So, and then, like you said, then on the other side you have some, oh, boom, a paragraph. Yeah, so it actually intrigues them, and then they read about it, like, oh, okay, so if I improve my diet, I can lose weight. All right, now we can move on to the that was a, that was a long get to know you kind of intro, <laughs> twelve minutes and thirty one seconds. Um, so now we can get into the starting a juice business one hundred and one. Wow, crash course. Are people still doing it? Don't do it, folks. <laughs> um. Okay. Wait, uh, what, a professional yep. broadcaster would never have to take time to like rifle through pages in their notebook. Well, that's all right. I I'm feel not, like you, uh, no, I feel like you'd have an iPad with a stand, uh-huh. and there'd be like a full outline there. Well, the good news is I'm I, waiting. I want to see it. The next good time news I is I, I make no money doing this. So, but you're a pro. <laughs> yeah, right. in, indirectly, you do make money. Well, yes. If if the juice industry does better and we sell more machines and we make money for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you have a you have a, a agenda. Agenda. Yes. You're, you're politically financially motivated. Yes. We want people to succeed. We're the Which e- is actually a good purpose because the, we need more juice yeah, bars in the world. The evil uh, juice empire. Um All right. So let's start with just a really brief history of where you're at in your life when you started juice press and like why you started it. Well, I've been in retail my entire life in one form or the other, and I had um, sold a, a, a sports business that I was involved in, skydiving, that I was uh, had retail, and uh, a video production company that was producing training films, had a mail order business in skydiving that sold parachute equipment A to Z, and I had gotten out of that business, and then as a step back into mainstream, I worked for my father for a couple of years in the art and antiques business retail, which was very familiar to me. And uh, I got myself uh, squared away where I wanted to be financially, and I was ready to make an exit completely. But of course, obviously, at that age of my life, I still have to work. So I sat for a year thinking about what I was going to do. And when I came to the conclusion I wasn't going to be a film producer, a songwriter, or whatever, I realized, like, look, I'm retail. Mm -hmm. So then the next thing is I just literally told my dad I want to do something where I could sit on a bench all day in the sunlight and drink juice and talk to people. And I had um, been a, a customer of that place, Liquiteria, which is now out of business. But they were really one of the major pioneers that I had ever seen anywhere on the planet of the juice bar that was rolled up in the way that he had that. Mm-hmm. And it's Doug Green, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So his his business, for me personally, was extremely quantifiable. I, I would go there and I would drink, you know, I'd have a smoothie or a juice and I would just sit there and I would stare at his business and I kind of hacked it in, in uh, probably by 2000, I had hacked his business and it was in my mind that I wanted to do it, but I thought in my mind that I would do it with him. So I had approached him a number of times and a lot of people approached him about expansion. They, they loved his business model and they loved the idea of the business itself, the theme. And, um, he just he he just didn't want to do it with anyone. It wasn't just me. I mean, I'm sure he had his reasons for not doing it with me because we talked, you know, a lot. We sat in his apartment. We went for walks, and he he didn't want to do a partnership. And by the time uh, 2009 was was came along, and I was out of my family business, I came back to this business. I had been working on a business plan for about a year, and when I got to the end of the business plan, I totally lost interest. I just said, you know what? This is not a good business. It's the margins are too low. It just seems like at every angle and every turn, there's some kind of complication. And unlike my father's business where 
the profit margins are so high, you can be rescued by one right. customer. Mm -hmm. the, the, the juice business is just a slow grind, pun intended. <laughs> it's a slow <laughs> nice grind uh, where you, there's not going to be any miraculous progress. It's going to be you know day by day, step by step. There's no customer that's going to walk in and spend a million dollars on juice. Right. And uh, you know you have to pay close attention to every single detail. And you just have to really just be a very, very dedicated and seasoned operator. And I was none of those things. Uh, what I was, though, was I was a risk taker. Obviously, I wasn't afraid to jump out of airplanes. And retail's in my blood, so I'm not afraid to take a lease. Mm. So when I had changed my mind not to do the juice business, I had a period of about two months where I felt like I was floating in space. I, 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 I didn't feel grounded. The store on East 1st Street was the first store I had seen for rent on that block in in the years of being on that block. And it was a tiny store, but I saw it, and it was like a, a, a movie moment where, you know that pan moment where the camera's zooming in, but maybe the thing is moving backwards? Yeah. My eyes just honed in on this, re this spot, and I just bolted across the street. I <laughs> took the phone number, I called the landlord, and we started a negotiation, and I was relentless to get that lease. And then when I got the keys to the store, I was standing in this tiny store going, okay, now what the hell am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So, and that uh, was, that was 2000 and, and that's a 10. spot on East first street. Yes. Okay. That was the first store. Mm -hmm. 2000, maybe it could have been late nine. Yeah. Maybe it was late 2009. Cause I think we opened in April of 2010, May of 2010. So it was the end of the end of, uh, 2009. So, my first reflex t when I went to that, t took that store, was to try to get a lot of people around me that would get, that would make up for my insecurities, and they were making up for my liabilities because I didn't have a accurate and thorough business plan to follow. If I had one, I would have just turned to page sixteen, which would be the page after getting the keys to the store, right. and say, "Okay, here's what you do next, schmuck." Mm -hmm. So I didn't really do that. What I did was I went through my phone, and I said, "I need a marketing PR person." So I called up an old nightclub person that I knew from years who I, you know, believed and actually was a, a very popular nightlife guy. And I felt like having a cool brand in the East Village would rely on a lot of, you know, the cool people hanging out in my spot. So I thought he would be a, a really important uh, part of the business. Uh, there was a guy who had a health food store four blocks away and a juice bar. I knew him from my gym. I ran to him and said, do you want to be involved? And he said, yes. He came, he looked at it and looked at me and said, how can I lose? And so he got involved. And then a, a childhood friend in New York popped into the store when I was uh, building uh, some part of the walls. And he was very excited. He said, I always wanted to have a juice bar. I said, all right, you're in. Nice. And um, I didn't really have any concept of what was going on. It was it, at that time what it did feel like was that the things that we needed came when we needed them to come. Mm. So um, we owned a Norwalk and we were blowing it up in uh, my apartment down the street, literally just like shooting carrots to the ceiling, figuring it out and, and, and making notes and trying to understand the machine. And uh, when we started to think about a food menu, we were thinking, scratching our heads going, what are we going to do? And my first instinct was to buy uh, cookbooks and, you know, copy recipes. Mm -hmm. But what happened is uh, someone introduced me to a raw food chef from Brazil. Mm. And he came in and he had the, the right energy to really take command and talk about how to build the kitchen and the things that he needed and what was going to be on the menu. And just having someone who felt comfortable with a knife in the kitchen made me very comfortable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, all right, is that, is, am I still on topic, by the way? Or am I? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I feel like you should ask questions. No, there's, I think I think my job is to get you talking. Oh, don't worry about that. You, you don't have any problem with that. Do you want me to continue on with that, uh, the progression? Yeah, so so maybe, all right, you had one store, um, you get all the right people involved. Well, not necessarily all the right people. I got the right oh, okay. people. You got for, some people involved. That, well, it's really important to make the different, to, to differentiate this and say very clearly is that I think ultimately we're all our own kind of an asshole. Mm-hmm. So you have to find somebody that's compatible with your assholeness. That's like, I, I mean, I say that in a New York kind of way. Because, you know, um, f looking back and telling an honest story, anyone that, that was with Juice Press, anyone from a person making smoothies to a particular partner was the right person for the time. 
to get the job done. And and the only way to grow is to analyze those relationships, understand what negative contributions that you made to them as well, if there was a negative output, so a negative result. And, and also, you know, write the positives. Don't just look at these relationships and say they're negative. I would say that the partners that I had involved at the time were exactly perfect for where I was at. Where I was at was I wasn't really confident. I was fake confident. I convinced myself I was confident. I was actually scared shit. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what I was doing. The things that came naturally to me are the things that gave me confidence. Like I had no fear negotiating for a lease. I had no fear mm -hmm. uh, coming up with a name, a logo. I had no fear picking building materials. I just didn't really have fear that somehow I would succeed. I didn't have that kind of mm -hmm. intellect. I was kind of dumb. Mm -hmm. um, I should have been more afraid, like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Uh, but the partners that I brought on, it seemed as though what I needed from my partner, Alan, was I needed a motivator. He was a guy mm -hmm. that drove me nuts, said all kinds of ridiculous things all the time about business, but he would keep me highly motivated. When I would get too involved in nickels and dimes, as an example, we were talking about a second location, and I would look at the location saying, I wonder how much the rent is. And then he'd say something like, why do you care about the rent? Let's buy the building. And he didn't have $7 in his bank account. But the <laughs> way that he thought, it always kept me seeing a big picture and mm. thinking like a big entrepreneur. And he was extremely valuable in that, in that way. And also in the areas where I felt very low confidence, like dealing with finance or understanding HR and payroll, he seemed extremely confident on those subject matters. And so it put me at ease that I can focus on the things that I was good at. Mm. Great. Um, so that's kind of leads into one of the first topics we have here is location selection. I mean, you saw a place Ooh. and you liked it and you got it. But Luckily I'm in New York. It's, it's hard to pick a loser in New York. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of losers in New York, especially in 2020. There's a lot of bad stores and a lot of vacancies, you know, location selection, you know, I, I actually have it in my writing. I actually have like a sequence of bullet points that you have to think about. And we, I jokingly used to have this argument with my dad. He, you know, we would always say there's an old retail, uh, I guess it's a cliche or par uh, an axiom or whatever. It says, you know, location, location, location. And it's repeated three times. Mm -hmm. And I made, uh, I, had, I did some writing why, what those three times, mm -hmm. when you say location, like what each thing means to a location. The first thing is that um, if you open a juice bar in the uh, Mojave Desert, you're probably going to fail, mm -hmm. even though people need liquid. There's nobody shopping mm -hmm. in that area, and so you're going to die. Um, and so when you think about location, the first thing to do is to look at a map of the city that you're in and pick go by, uh, go by uh, rent, the most expensive locations, and analyze why they're really expensive. And the way to analyze locations that are really expensive is to look at who your co-tenants are. If you're if you're Fifth Avenue and there's Louis Vuitton and all these huge brands mm -hmm. that um, are paying massive rents, you can understand why the dollar per square foot over there is very high. And there's uh, population density. How many people are walking by your store is obviously an important factor, but that's a fooling factor because you could open up uh, a juice bar, um, you know, in Times Square, and I assure you, it's not going to do well. Mm -hmm especially if your price point is high because you have a lot of traffic, but you have the wrong passerbys. Mm -hmm. So the traffic is only important if it's the right traffic. And so how you analyze a neighborhood is you have to try to figure out the, the, the demographics, who, who live in this neighborhood. So one of the ways to back into a neighborhood is when you look at the rent and you have a business model, you need to figure out how many human beings you have to serve in a single day. And then you have to do some calculations and say, if this location only has... 19 people that walk by a day, then it's, we're setting up a destination location. People will hear that we're great. They live far away, three, four blocks, 10 blocks, whatever it is in different cities. They're going to come here as part of their day. If it's, a, if it's a, most places outside of New York, people are driving to a location. You really want to see who your co-tenants are and what's the draw to that location because eventually after the buzz of your opening a year or so later starts to wear down and a person goes back to their regular lifestyle, if you're really inconvenient, that's going to come back to, to haunt you. Mm. So, you know, I, I think that another thing that people make a mistake in, in renting a store is 
they, they, they look at it the way they would rent a home or they rent a house. When they hear a number on the rent, they don't think of it as a business person. They say, oh, look, it's cheap rent. It's cheap rent, it's a smaller store, and it's probably not in a great location. You're paying for what you get. If the rent, let's say, is $5,000 there and it's off location and you're not getting traffic or visibility, but six blocks away there's a masterpiece location that has thousands of people walking by and it's located near a train and the rent is 25000 a month and you get scared of that number because you think, wow, 25000 is a lot of money to have to come up with. You just have to adjust your business model and say, okay, can I handle this mm -hmm. if we're having a bad month or we're having a slow startup? Um, can I handle the security deposits that would have to go into a larger rent? But generally, don't shy away from a location just because the rent seems higher. It has to be plugged into your business model, into a matrix where you're saying, okay, if 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 it's twenty five thousand a month, the store really to technically be where we need it to be has to generate two and a half million dollars in gross sales. If we don't think that we can do that, then the rent, of course, is off. But if there's a possibility or a location like that can do four million in sales, it's a home run. Mm -hmm. So you, you really have to think of those things and say, okay, look, we're we have a shoestring budget. All our life savings is going to this. There's no way in the world that we're going to be able to afford a six-month security deposit or even three-month security deposit. So all those things go into being factors to deciding how you rent a location. Yeah, the landlord thinks about that when they set the price. So you need to think about that when you're renting, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say that there's other factors, too. Is This is a big factor. Is A big part of the location selection is how does the location itself feel to you? There's no real way to explain why an off location sometimes is the right location, but the explanation I use is the case of the speakeasy. Mm -hmm. A speakeasy would never be on Main Avenue with a 35-foot storefront and lots of lights. Speakeasies were always on a side street. They were somewhere hidden. And so that was part of their mystique. Mm -hmm. So people talk about them, and you need to know that they exist. So that's what marketing is. Hmm. It, it, the location has to be right for the type of business. I think that if you open on Main Street and you're a, a juice bar and you you really stand out as being irreverent and you're really outspoken about nutrition and health, one would say being sandwiched between Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's on Main Street would probably hurt your location, mm -hmm. even though there's lots of foot traffic. But simply going right around the corner into an inline store that's not a corner store and being that smaller place that people have to just go, oh, did you hear about that place? Or they see it through your clever branding, you know, the bags that people carry with the product and, you know, the merch that people wear. You know, there's, uh, you, could, you could do, you know, home spun uh, uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. I think those type of locations are usually cooler for a juice bar. And the location itself has to feel inviting. When you have a space that has high ceilings or a, a sunlight feature from a, coming from a backyard or a skylight, uh, or something about the space just feels good to be in, people are drawn to that. Mm. So in selecting a location, really be mindful about taking spots that don't actually feel good to be in, because mm. I think that's going to affect any retail business, but especially a health and wellness business. Right. Needs to feel inviting and healthy, right? It's got to feel organic. Right. I mean, could spend a lot of time going through my notes and organizing just that particular thought of, course, of what yeah. makes a space feel great to people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have a location that has a backyard and there's a forest behind you and there's beautiful sunlight coming in, people just want to go there to feel that. Right. Now you have great product and great staff and a great story. It's got to be a home run. Right. Um, and then you put on a topic, business modeling. Woo! <laughs> Business modeling. Okay, well, you know, I'm working on a business plan right now, and the first thing I see about it is that I know that it's really hard because very wealthy people that I know that are hedge fund people that look at businesses, they don't actually write business plans. They give a deck writing job to someone else who can sit mm. and do the tedious work. And it's very tedious work, and uh, we get lost in it. I was just on the phone with my cousin who wants to start up a totally separate business, and I sent him a link to this 200-page business plan that I have right now. I've been working on it for 12 months. I know that it's too long, and it's kind of the way I talk, where I'm compressing a lot of information into something. But for me, this is my method. It's how I work. Now, with the experience I have, 
there's no way in the world I'm going into the food and beverage business or any business until I can explain to myself how I got to the finish line exactly the same way you would if you bought a piece of Ikea furniture and it came with a booklet of instructions. Mm. I want to see all the moving parts. I want to have descriptions. I want to know where step one is, and I want to see where step 36 is, and I want to see a picture of what it looks like when it's done. So that's very tedious work, and it's not something I can pass off to a consultant. I have to sit with myself and do a couple hours a day of my writing. And when I write, I find that I get to a problem that I don't know the answer to. So then I have to go search out the answer. How am I going to make that happen? Mm. And then I write the solution as if I'm writing instructions. And so it's a discipline. And many times in this project have I come to the point where I was at before I opened Juice Press, Juice Press which is I don't think this is a great business. But something keeps compelling me mm. to do this. It's something that I really recognize that I want to do. Uh, if I was a billionaire, I would open up juice bars in every city, just one. I don't have to be crazy. And make them a specific way. And I would find a way to make the price point so that it was more accessible to more people. This is like my charitable fantasy in my mm -hmm. mind is that I would create a juice business in every city that didn't have to be profitable. And um, I don't know why I, I foster such a fantasy. Um, maybe I have some Actually, I know guilt a way, complex. I know a way. We Messiah could, complex. I, know, I, don't know. I know a way we could do that. Um, We've been talking. Well, you know, way we could lose money. <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking. So why? <laughs> we've been talking for years about opening a Good Nature Cafe, which is like combination showroom, um, experimenting with new machines and methods, and also a functioning juice bar. You know how to make a million dollars with a juice bar? Don't open it. No, start with two million. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough business, but we wouldn't have to be profitable. That was my point on that, because it'd be more of like a like it a. Sounds like there's a business venture here, guys. <laughs> yeah. Let's well, do it. That'd, we, that'd be a fun project. You know, it it would be anything but fun. Uh huh. Be a nightmare, hard work. It'd be a brilliant project. It's definitely epic. It's definitely a legacy project if you make it succeed. But there's a lot of things in between because uh, it's as you know, and, or maybe not. I think you're on the you're on the machine side of this, and um, obviously you, you probably talk to a lot of retailers. I don't know how in depth you go with them, but I'm here to spill it all out right now and give something to the community. Uh, not, you know, the way I look at opening a retail business is it's really similar to skydiving. It's a lot of fun. It's just extremely dangerous. You have to have the constitution for it. Mm -hmm. And when the door opens for the first time, I guarantee you, you're going to be hesitant and say, what the hell am I doing? But, you know, you got a parachute on. It seems exciting. Let's do it. Yeah. Once you're out of the airplane, I don't think you waste a lot of time thinking about, holy shit, what did I just do? Am right, I crazy? Yeah, totally. You're just now in that mode of let's make it work. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, that's how I think it's a very exciting and exhilarating uh, experience. I think um, the majority of people that would do a business like this, I would believe have a lot of prudence, so they would have a lot of meticulous planning. But you only, you don't know what you don't know. So you can't really plan if you have no idea what you're going into. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need somebody like me shouting in your ear all the obvious things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would say I know about one one millionth of what there is to know about any of this, and I sound like I know a lot. Mm -hmm. So if if a person feels overwhelmed by the whole concept, it's it's that's truth. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as I gave you a parachute and said, get in the door, and I didn't train you, and your body's going, you're crazy, what are you doing? Your body's right. Mm -hmm. It's insanity. What are you doing? You have no idea what you're doing. So the way to get good at it is to arm yourself with knowledge and information. You've got to become smart in the subject. Mm -hmm. The first subject is this is retail. You're going into the retail business. You are dealing face-to-face -face with consumers, and there are a finite number of retail problems that apply to every single retail business. So you have to have that whole list in your mind. What does that mean? And I would say... Wow, you're getting me excited. <laughs> I would say food retail is even more difficult than like clothing retail. No, man, that's a myth. You think so? Absolutely. Clo every retail business has its complicated problems. Mm -hmm. It's it's only difficult if you're not made for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be designed to deal with the problems. There's things about the food business that are easy than the clothing, easier than a clothing business. One of the things that's difficult, you would say a business like my dad's art business is an easy retail business. You buy merchandise, you sit there and wait, it's a high margin business. 
problem with that business is you always have four or five million dollars of your cash tied up in inventory. inventory right. So there's always something difficult about any business. Get that out of your mind mm. that a business is more difficult than the other. Okay. It's just it's a mistake. If you don't want difficulty, sit at home and do nothing. Because mm-hmm. I was going to say go surfing. Even that's difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's difficult too. <laughs> so, the, you know, the the concept is you're not going to open a retail business and simply go to the beach and walk away. Mm-hmm. It's a commitment for a period of time. And the commitment is not different than giving birth to a child. It needs attention 24-7. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing everything right and you're lucky and you have uh, – revenue rolling in it's it's a lot easier and it's a it could be a nine to five it could be a nine to seven sometimes maybe a sunday morning um but in the startup of a business it really needs constant attention there's things that are going on all the time and a person has to enjoy that kind of conflict or that type of excitement you know um it's it's just not it's it's definitely not for the faint of heart Mm -hmm. uh there's machines there's people there's customers there's product you got your landlord breathing down your neck, the city uh, violations, and uh, all different types of stuff coming in from every angle. Just write it down and understand that that's what it is. Or just be, you know, sheer grit. Say, I'll take it as it comes. Because that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I had days in the first few months of Juice Press. I remember, and I have to admit it honestly, I'm not really a crier. I was so frustrated and so overwhelmed. It was. I think it was 2 o'clock in the morning, I sat down on the floor, a dirty floor, with my back up against a, a, uh, a true refrigerator, a two-door low boy, and I wasn't crying. I just had my hands down, and I felt that mm. crying pain in the throat. I couldn't actually cry, but I was so overwhelmed, I hated what I was doing. I said, what the hell did I get myself into? But I had a way of resetting every day without drinking alcohol or doing drugs. I just reset my mind every day. I'd go to bed. And I, I think I was a dummy. I would just wake up and it's a new day every day. And so I would, uh, you know, I'd have a, a setback day and then the next day things would run nicely. And then there were times where I would just be like, oh my God, this is the greatest experience of my life. Uh, one, one such experience was I was in a store that we had opened in the Hamptons. I just happened to be visiting and a woman walked up and she had a handkerchief, uh, a scarf wrapped around her head. And she said, "What? you're very soft-spoken. Do you recommend a green juice for someone who has cancer. And I started to talk to her, and we spoke for about 45 minutes. Uh, I put her on the phone with this guy, Fred Bishi, because she had some really complex questions about a chemotherapy she was on. I, I don't know how to talk about that stuff, so I, you know, I, I used the phone call to pass the torch. And when we were done, her, her daughter had come in and said, you helped my mother so much, I really appreciate it. And I actually felt very choked up. Mm. And I realized that I really had made a great choice about the type of retail service business that I had got myself into was the thing that I wanted to see myself doing for the rest of my life. Right. You get to see it affecting other people's lives. In a a great way. In a great way. I mean, it's that for any industry, really. I was with my wife yesterday, and she was in a cosmetic store. And it's a very different experience, obviously, and we can be judgmental of that industry. But the questions that the guests are asking to the, uh, the, the store reps... They're really asking them the same mysterious questions about life, and they're looking mm. for connections, and they're looking for something that makes them feel good. And I think if a product is compassionate in all ways, and the, the, the nature of that business is compassionate, it's a, it's a positive contribution to life. You know, we're not destroying people. I get more judgmental when I think about places that serve alcohol and tobacco, and I, I, I'm not a religious person. I just really think about it from a a, a, a tragic way that we have those substances that are so self-destructive to our life. When I look at those industries, you know, again, I feel very grateful to be very far away from being a bar owner, a nightclub owner. Right. No, no, I, I know a lot of bar and nightclub owners, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. I think they know exactly what I'm talking about. Being a, a night owl, and you know, the whole nature of just swinging alcohol around for you know a glass of wine is twenty three dollars it's like it's a really a it's an entertainment business mm-hmm. it's not something that would be fulfilling to me it would be very taxing on me so the juice business really is the opposite it's very rewarding to get involved with people who are struggling with various issues whether it's just they they, they feel overweight and they want to get back into shape or just somebody who's who knows that food is playing a very important role in their life to be able to 
lead by example and actually have some knowledge about the subject, it's very it's very rewarding. Do I sound like like a complete nerd and an idiot? No. God, what did I become? I used to be a really mean guy. <laughs> so I I think that's the great thing about this industry. Um, and I know you haven't been to JuiceCon yet. Hopefully you'll come next time. But you get in a room with hundreds of people that have transformed their life through juice, and then they start a business to help other people do that. And you get all the energy in the room. Not all of them are great business owners or operators, but they're all very passionate about what they do. And that's what I've learned and why I love being a part of this industry. It's a great industry. I think yeah. exposure really makes a difference. I mean, if I could manage my time to help every single person in the juice industry, I know I have a lot to offer um, because I'm writing it out and I'm writing out process. I'm in the middle right now. I have a really incredible training program that I'm writing for a Pilates company. And um, I'm working from onboarding studio reps to uh, the manager training. And I'm collaborating with their instructor trainers to tighten up the instructor training program. And I can see how people respond to my style of writing mm. and what I bring to the table. I think that I can say that I've learned aspects of a retail business well and i and i just really am excited now because i've resigned that this is a major aspect of my life is to learn Th this business is my zen meditation of learning about my character and learning about myself and just continuing to educate myself like right now i would say the area that i work the most on is i really try to focus in on understanding the concept of what is a good business model and getting the uh the right numbers behind the theory. So I, I, my breakthrough after almost a decade of staring at this and being with a very financial person as a partner, my breakthrough is that the business itself is really just a, it's a theory. It's like somebody, it's like an astronomer looking up at the stars and saying, I think this is what's happening right. in the cosmos with the black hole. And it's a great theory and it gets everybody thinking, but if you can't put math behind it, it's it, it really can't be proven that it's right. It's just a theory. It's just a it's a concept. So the numbers and the theory play close hand in hand. They're very important together. Mm -hmm. I was good at I was always good at the theory. Right. But I really didn't know how to put numbers. And that's in. how a lot of entrepreneurs are great at that part of the theory. Right. But then they bring in people to help with all the But the, but a financial and... person is not the numbers is not the right person to to lean on because what you really need is you need a person who's a hybrid. They're an entrepreneur mm -hmm. who understands the theory and who could make the numbers themselves. Mm -hmm. Albert Einstein had a very hard time with some of his theories because he wasn't great at math. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, by our standing, he was beyond genius, but in the math community standards, he struggled with certain things because mm -hmm. he needed someone to help him with the math of his theories. Uh, which is way off topic, but it's not just going to a, a, a CFO and saying, tell me what, what, what's going on. It's really just not. A, a finance person is not going to come to you and say, you know, I think that in order for us to have a better brand, our staff need to wear chef coats. Mm. And then you have to dial in the cost of chef coats into the numbers. An entrepreneur has to create the idea and have some concept of the numbers or work with a numbers person, ask the right questions, as a team, it's different than saying, okay, I'm just going to give this to a financial person. And when you structure even a one-store business, there has to be weekly one-hour meetings that are around the critical subjects of the business. So every week you'd have a one-hour finance meeting where these topics come up and we discuss the business model. We discuss our, our financial needs coming up for the next month. We look at the numbers. We try to figure out what levers we could pull to improve business. Um, another critical uh, one-hour meeting is innovation, where in food business, in a food context, we're really just talking about the menu, what's selling, what's not selling, uh, what we think consumer trends might be. We talk about, um, to, to make it more concise in a small business, everything come up. You can bring up in that meeting um, how you're sourcing produce, where you're buying, uh, you know, ways to save money on that kind of stuff. So the innovation of the product is a very important meeting. And then there has to be an ops meeting once a week. And that ops meeting should be, you know, an hour meeting where we talk about things that are going on in the operations meeting. Another critical meeting is an HR meeting where we talk about how we're uh, acquiring new staff, uh, how we're doing our training, you know, things that are taking place within the uh, culture, like, you know, arguments, someone's being fired, someone just got hired. So those are... 
uh, I would say the, the the top categories of one one hour meetings that the discipline of holding those meetings is like the discipline of going to your yoga class every day or going to the gym. You got to have those meetings, and the meetings. The thing that I implemented in the business that I'm working on right now was something that I didn't have as a tool before. Was there's somebody sitting at the meeting with a laptop open taking notes. Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking. We actually have minutes of that meeting, and the person who's writing the minutes is effective in their role because they know how to uh, put certain writing into a task format, and they might even be able to, to know exactly who to assign a task mm. to, and from that note, they keep accountability of, or they're keeping a record of what we're bringing up in the next meeting, Right. because we started talking about Thanks. this on... Uh, the the fifteenth now here comes the twenty first. By the way, we we didn't figure out that problem, or here's the progress that we made. So the this is the key in any operation. Is this this is an operation uh, uh, must we we must have those meetings, and they have to be uh, structured, and they have to be uh, there has to be someone there who's taking notes so that there can be follow up. Mm -hmm. Um, you touched on a couple. We, we, we jumped into operations, right? Yes, <laughs> we jumped into a lot. So, uh, talked about getting a CFO or numbers guy, hiring staff. So, just in general, what's your philosophy on recruiting for your business? Well, first and foremost, a small business doesn't need to have <clears throat> executive titles. Executive titles come with executive salaries, uh, and it's it's very premature to think that a single store unit is going to have a thing that's really called a chief executive officer or chief finance officer. It's really that's more like to me that's putting on a costume. It reminds mm -hmm. me of a kid who puts on a cowboy costume and fantasizes that they're a cowboy. In that moment, they're a cowboy, but in real life, it's it's just a kid. Mm -hmm. So those titles they're they're way overkill for a, a, a tiny business. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring it up as a problem is if you hire someone, give them the title of CFO, and now you get to 17 stores and you're taking on uh, investors' money and investors want a more seasoned right. person in that role, it's very hard to demote someone say, I'm sorry, you're not CFO anymore. You're now the bookkeeper. Right. So you have to be careful with how you swing titles around in the company. I think that it's a big mistake to for an owner. I mean, I know that people want their prestige and they have their pride. If if you take on a severe title like king, then that means that you have to have queens and bishops and rooks. Mm. And now everyone's overpaid, and everyone has a ridiculous. So you can just title. be the founder. Founder, yeah, and you can have. It's not that impressive. Believe and you me, can have managers. If you show me your business card and you have one store and it says president on there, I'm not that impressed. Right. President of what? Mm -hmm. Like the the tiny coffee shop on the corner. It's not necessary. It it gets in the way. It's nonsense. It's ego. Your business card says founder. Very clean. It means everything. What does it mean? I do everything. Mm -hmm. I'm in charge. I started it. I, I, I did the LLC. My name's on the responsible guy for uh, sales tax. Uh, I'm dealing with the rats and the roaches in the basement. If you know, if an if employee uh, slips, in, that's me. So founder. And actually, when I met you this summer in front of your store, you were retouching paint on a post outside or something. Uh, I, I was bored. Was... I, was probably just, <laughs> I was doing it to impress you. Yeah, right. You're like, I'm going to pretend I work yes. around here. <laughs> I, like, I get the broom and I start sweeping when I know people important are coming around. Uh, <laughs> that's one of my golden rules, right? No, I, I think so. When you look, what you're looking for at the stage of when you're opening a store is you're looking for a director of finance. That's a dignified title. And that's pretty much, I like those director names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you want to, when you're interviewing someone, there's a hundred different mediums, thousands of mediums you use to recruit people, from ranging from headhunters, depending on your budget, to you know the websites that have jobs uh, that are being uh, sought after, etc. Um, and, and I'm not—I wouldn't say I'm the most modern guy in 2020. Like from the back of my head, the last time we were hiring, we were using things like LinkedIn, and I personally don't have a great recollection of those things being extremely. Uh, unbelievably useful. I mm -hmm. think you have to use those sources, uh, especially in the beginning, but it's kind of like uh, romance and dating. I, I have found that most of the people that I know that are married or are in a relationship, they met their spouse or partner through an introduction. Yes, through their through, network. Through their yeah. network. Yeah. And so I think that you have to 
first and foremost, as an entrepreneur, recognize the important value of always creating a big network. You got to go to shindigs. You got to meet people. You got to hand out a business card. You got to go to the fashion show, the art opening. You have to go to uh, the, you know, the lectures on self-help, to the mm-hmm. yoga studio. You have to have a network uh, because in the retail business, you are in the public-facing business. It's, it's a right. tiny political role, but you're a public-facing person, so you have to create that marketing wheel, and it starts with your network of people. So when you're interviewing a person... Um, for the role of director of finance, how much, how well you can hire is really based on your own experience with the subject matter. If you're an extremely experienced finance person, you're going to know exactly what questions to ask, and you're going to look at the resume and see what jobs they held and for how long and what school they went to. But most people aren't really like that. So I recommend that before you hire somebody for such a critical role, there's only probably about 35 billion books out there on exactly that subject. You know, get an audio book or listen to a podcast and start educating yourself right away on what you're looking for in a finance person in your organization. Do the same thing for HR. Do the same thing for a director of operations. And today in the information age, in a very short period of time, you could become very flight simulator studied. Mm -hmm. Because obviously learning that stuff in a book is not the real world. But flight simulators are extremely important for pilots. They they really prepare a pilot for the real deal. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same thing with reading and listening to podcasts and things like this. Is you sit and listen, you start you start your base of knowledge, you take what you can, and then obviously you're gonna have to make your mistakes out in the field. Yeah. Um so if someone's listening to this, say they're starting a juice bar. But they're thinking, I have no idea what to even look for in a finance person. Would you recommend they bring in a consultant to help? Or no, there's no such thing. I mean, consult consultant, a consultant, because you have to also be good at that. You have to be good at picking a consultant. So if you if you don't know a right. subject, how can you be good at picking a consultant? You're going to pick somebody who has set up themselves to sell you their goods and wares. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that all consultants are bad. It's just very difficult and very slim pickings out there to find a good consultant. Most consultants that are good own their own business, right. and they don't charge as much as you would think they might like you and do what I'm doing, for example. I'm consulting right now, and I'm consulting for free. Uh, because Almost more like advising or something? It's an advisor. If you have yeah. a mentor in retail, you go to them, and uh, you ask them questions, and, and certainly you're not alone. It's not like you're the first person going out to try to find where to, how to make fire. There's a lot of businesses out there that you can spend your time, and you should, as homework. If you've never been in retail and you don't do a retail expedition for six months, three months, two months, where you go to all the retail stores in your town and you take pictures and make mental notes about what you think is good and what's not good, and you start to make yourself aware of details, and you watch your progress as time goes on, how vast your experience and the details that you pick up. Today, the things that I write about retail, I still take pictures five days a week. I'm taking pictures of at least one retail concept, and I'm writing what I do and don't like based on experience. I went to a brand yesterday, a cosmetic place called Glossier. Very cool, fresh. Uh, I know that they're well-funded, very well-polished brand. And I said... My wife asked her first question in a nearly perfect experience, we bought nothing, was, are these all natural products? And the, the, the person could not reply with the answer yes. Whoa. And so yeah. her, her move was, let's go to our website. And she had an iPad and they went to the website and I realized the ridiculousness that someone had to show someone a column, a list of natural ones and unnatural ones. And I said, that, that's okay, this is a billion dollar business. It's not for me. And it's not something that I would want to have to look and go, hey, let me show you the ones that I have that are not poison and the ones that I do that are have poison. Right. That, to me, is not a business with integrity. And that's to me, it's just not a business that's interesting to me. And I'm speaking to the people who want to be in the juice business. Integrity and the highest standards are the only thing that makes sense. You could get lucky with a weirdo brand like J- Jamba Juice, but there's a really fatal end. Mm-hmm. If you look at Jamba Juice, they went skyrocketing to the moon and they took a nosedive. Mm-hmm. And I could get into that on another podcast, why why the philosophy of the business has to be consistent to the business. It doesn't make sense 
except in Las Vegas. Everything makes sense in Las Vegas. <laughs> if a juice bar that has a 100% natural and has a USDA logo and, and is, it's a bright and sunny place, it makes no sense that you'd be serving alcohol. Right. It doesn't make sense that you si- have sizzling bacon on the back grill. It makes sense in bodegas. It makes sense in the uh, neighborhood uh, uh, deli because those are like catch-alls and it's a specific type of guest who's paying the minimum dollar for something. But it doesn't make sense in a juice bar. Mm. It just doesn't follow a reasonable paradigm. So you have to model your business. We sort of going back to business model is model your business around something that makes sense. And what you oftentimes find in the health and wellness space is a lot of the businesses that we want to create there, they just don't make sense. There's not enough customers. And when there are customers, the product that we're selling, they're very low margin. Mm-hmm. So the genius is the one who could make it up in volume. You can't do a juice bar business, a health food business, and say, we're going to work on high margins. Mm. That's going to save us. It's got to be a high volume business. Mm. So you have to have a good product range. And we have to go into product at some point to really talk about that more in depth. But um, I lost track. What the hell was I talking about? Um, I Am I saying anything here that makes sense? Of, of course. Do I, I just curious. Do I sound like a complete raving lunatic? No, this is exactly what our audience wants to hear. Okay. So, yeah. You know what? You, 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 don't, you don't show, like, I would figure there'd be, like, light coming out of your eyes right now. You're like, you'd be like, <laughs> oh, my God, he just knows. I'm, I'm kidding. I don't know. Um, so, all right. So, so going back to uh, hiring people and, you know, having a business model that makes sense for the business, how does culture play into that and, and building a company culture? Woo! Man, you're touching all the points. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> I think people have to do, first and foremost, is Google the word culture as it pertains to relationships. <clears throat> that word is one of the buzzwords that floats around and no one really understands what it means. It's like religion. You have a culture on every side of your business. There's a culture that takes place in the kitchen. There's a culture that's taking place between coworkers. There's a culture of the owner and how they communicate to their workers. There's a culture that the customer outside of the store has within society of how they think about your business. There's a culture of how your corporate team work and how they get things and projects done. So you can't just say culture. Mm-hmm. It's cultures in a business. Right. And the buzzword culture is oftentimes confusing and it doesn't help people think about what we're talking about what we're talking about in the culture is we're really just talking about impressions and relationships what are people's impressions of what's going on and what are people relationships like there's cultures that are extremely competitive and they're very uh, tactical they're very devoid of human experience i i think of one oftentimes is when i think about a venture capital group with an office and I, I remember one that I had seen where you're, you're programmed to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning with a very uncomfortable suit and tie. You're sitting in a very large office. Uh, the walls are white. There's no artwork. There's no music playing. Everyone's sitting in a cubicle. And it's a mad dash for productivity and for making money. And <clears throat> there isn't a lot of friendly interaction in that environment because there it's, it's a war room, essentially. And the way that a person is compensated is that they get a $600,000 bonus at the end of the year. Right. A person could work like that forever. Mm-hmm. In a business where we're likely paying people the, 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 the minimum wage of a city or a little bit more than that, um, you can't run a business it can't on that be about the culture. money. Yeah. People have to, uh, they have to love the owner. They have to love the relationships. They have to love the product. Um, and that's a very tough thing for a lot of people to build because they're, they haven't built that in their lives. Their personalities may not be very warm and inviting. Mm. So if, I'm, if I was uh, advising a, a, a CEO, a founder, the first thing is I don't want them to change them. I don't want them to make them into a phony. But I want to at least get them working on themselves and their character. <coughs> they can't bring their standard methods of communicating that they've done in outside relationships into a business. The relationship has a power differential, and you're also, you're a motivator. You're, you're, you're Coach uh, Belichick of the, the Patriots. That's mm-hmm. who you are. You should see yourself as that. How do I motivate these talented young people 
to work their ass off and hustle so the team wins. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? The first thing you got to bring is you got to bring knowledge to the table. People will listen to someone who knows something. The second thing is you got to treat people like they're your equal. Mm -hmm. And you have to recognize how vital they are to the team. Your cashier is just as important as the financial person sitting in the corporate office because they're the, they're the, they're the frontier of the whole business. If they're not happy, your customer is touching them. He's not touching the financial person. So it's not just compensation that makes happy workers. Right. It's the mission statement being written on the wall or written on a website or on a postcard or ha handed out in a sheet. What is the mission statement of your business? If it's a positive thing, people will likely buy into it. If it's a thing that just says mission statement, make lots of money, that's the culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why those companies really just make lots of money. Mm -hmm. But again, there's lots of money involved, so that type of culture really works. Try that in your juice bar business. You're going to have a lot of unhappy people. So one of the problems in any re retail environment is in smaller cities or places that are more remote, there is likely to be a very limited um, pool of talent that have the maturity to be responsible for their character. Mm -hmm. The tasks are rather easy, but getting people to show up on time and getting people to go the extra mile that doesn't come naturally for a lot of people. And that doesn't mean that they're, those people are a waste. That's your talent pool. You better get used to it. You can't walk around bad-mouthing your talent underneath your breath. Mm. You've got to actually say, this is the talent I have. I'm out here in Skogie, Illinois. I'm not hiring people that came into the workforce with tremendous experience. A lot of times you're going to be hiring people that are new to the workforce and they just need to adapt and learn how to have a boss, learn how to take direction, learn how to do tasks that aren't self-centered. So that requires incredibly good management. Mm -hmm. A great manager recognizes that right from the start that they're leading people to basically do a lot of unsavory tasks. And what you're trying to teach as a manager is you're really trying to teach people how to use their job as a Zen enlightenment practice. Like, like you would think of a, a, a tea party, a ceremonial tea party, where every move has a meaning for consciousness. It's very difficult to teach to an 18-year-old. It's difficult to teach to anyone at any age. But if you don't find creative ways to teach that, what you'll be doing for your entire career is just chasing people around trying to get them to do tasks. Mm -hmm. That type of operation is very expensive to run. It's very tiring. So I don't Does that quite, make any sense? Uh, uh, I oh, think I need a, a little more, more explanation okay, on, on what you mean by each move is conscious. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. So how, how do you teach somebody that? Well, your first discussion is to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Plant the seed. We, we, that's the greatest tool in marketing is... When people are on the train, for example, they see a small logo of your company and there's not a lot of words and there's not a lot of imagery because there's not a lot of room on that particular shape. They leave the train and they're walking up the ramp and they see a bigger billboard, same logo, the ad is expanded. They get out of the train and now you have a full-size billboard on the street. That brand is imprinted in a person's subconsciousness through a very specific technique, right. which is seed to plant. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk about consciousness... Just start the discussion. Sit down with your staff and say that word. It's the first time they're hearing it. There'll be a lot of lemons in your group because not everybody cares. No matter what you do, some people are not going to ever become conscious. And that's okay because those people, you just they might be great at their tasks. And if they're not, you just have to say goodbye to them, right? But there's a lot of people that actually will hear the truth. And you'll say to a young person, look, I'm going to teach you in a short period of time how you're building your career path. I'm going to teach you how to be a very needed worker in a company, someone that we all lean on and rely upon. I'm going to teach you how to not be miserable and bored because you have to spend eight hours at work. It's very difficult, uh, but it has to be addressed, um, especially if you're, as I said before, in a place where the talent pool is very limited. In a city like New York, there's a lot more people, and you and you have a, a, a greater uh, uh, you have a greater range of people you can interview and decide if someone has the experience. And 
in a, in a short period of time, you can make snap judgments about their positivity or their excitement to come to work for you. You could, you know, a lot of that obviously could be faked to someone who's who's good at taking a job interview. You know, so obviously you just have to jump out of a plane with somebody and now you're in the skydive and you're going to learn what you're going to learn about that person. But if you have a, a system, a bullet points of how you're going to determine if someone is good for your team and you know that you have options, you're less likely to hang on to someone out of, mm-hmm. out of desperation, which is a common behavior that people do in their life. They have some terrible friends that have been right. around for 15 years. They've just been around. Nobody wants to be lonely. Yeah. In a business... The way I, the the uh, the metaphors that I use, and I'm oftentimes laughed at in a mostly female business in Pilates. The metaphors that I work with are the metaphors of either a military ship or a, a an old uh, an old uh, fishing boat going out to to sea, you know, to the Flemish caps. In that type of business, I guarantee you, no one keeps someone around because they have an attachment to them. Mm. They need that person to know how to tie all the knots and they need to know that that person is reliable and that they won't abandon their post and that they won't burden the ship Mm -hmm. because the consequence of not having the right person on the team could be disaster. It's just really simple. And the reason why it's such an effective metaphor is life and death on a ship. In a juice bar, it's really casual. No one's going to die. It's not as scary. But we linger on in a business sometimes it's not working because we have the wrong team and we don't know how to say, wait a second, this is a ship. It's going to sink if I don't have great sailors on board and if I'm not a great captain. Yeah. One saying I really like is that uh, no person is as big as the company, right? Or the company is bigger than any single person. And usually when you are considering letting someone go and you finally do – it's kind of like a relief and actually the company gets better, you know? So it's probably better to do it sooner rather than later. Everyone has their own process of, of mm-hmm. coming to the conclusion. You know, when you have a company, you're going to be in the hiring business. You're in the HR business. Uh, you're not in the firing business. And so the idea is to make good choices in who you hire. But unfortunately, there's going to be people who quit and there's going to be people who are not good and you don't have the time to develop them or people who do things that are, uh, completely disruptive to the business uh, and violate the tenets of laws, whatever they are. You know, so obviously you have to be prepared to uh, let people go. And I think that one of the things that's an important thing to do before you build a business that centers around people is to <clears throat> adapt things from what you read about HR, put them into your own writing, and they should go into your own business uh, plans in your own HR books about the emotional aspects of letting go of people and how it's done in, a, in your company. There should be a standard operating procedure on how we hire and how, we, um, w- how we're recruiting, <clears throat> how we're warning people that are not doing things, how we reward them, how we let people go. So that has to be something that's planned and not just done on the fly. And certainly not done in ways that humiliate people or humiliate the staff or humiliate a patron. I've seen people get fired in front of patrons, and that's a terrible, terrible thing for a brand. Mm-hmm. It's it's absurd. It's actually so ridiculous. It violates, when I even say it, it violates the laws of retail nature. Mm-hmm. So a person has to know what the F they're doing when it comes to that stuff. You know, uh, these are relationships and in, in, in uh, and, and this is a brand and it's a business. The way you hire and the way you fire have to be an integral part of how you see the brand because there's no secrets in a brand. Everything that you do somehow leaches out into the product and into the public domain. It just does. It takes time sometimes, but if you have a shitty corporate culture, it just leaks and becomes toxic to the retail culture. Mm-hmm. Amen. All right, so let's say you have a single location juice bar now. Yeah. You get the right people on board. How do you decide how many products and how many SKUs you want to create and sell and how many products you want to innovate? It depends on how much money you have to waste. Okay. Really. I mean that honestly. Uh, You know, that's a big part of it. I would budget in a store concept. I would make sure that you have enough money to make mistakes. Mm Mm-hmm. And don't go in there sliding in on the skin of your teeth and think that your revenue that you generate is going to be enough to keep you floating. It should keep you floating your revenue 
as a, at once the business is established and you're saying, okay, now the baby is off, I'm sorry, the child is off to school, they're going to learn what they're going to learn. The business is the same way. You build up your business and then you have to say, okay, now it has to sustain on its own and it has to make economic sense. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, when you're opening a business, there's so many variables. You can't just say, how many SKUs should I start with? The, the store is going to dictate to you what it wants to be sold. You might start off with 10 and find that the business is just very slow moving. You, you bumped up your level, your SKUs to 50, all of a sudden you have a business. So you're going to have to experiment. I come from a different mentality of retail. I would start off with too many products in the beginning. That's when everybody has energy, make it extremely complicated in terms of how you produce and all the SKUs you have and how are we going to get all these labels and where are we going to get all these ingredients and it's going to go bad. But I would start off with the maximum number of SKUs mm -hmm. and then you do in your innovation meetings and the meetings that you're sitting and looking at reports, you evaluate very quickly. This thing is a, is a terrible seller. Boom, it's off the menu. This thing is really great. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a version 2.0 of it like this. We're going to see if we have two things now that sell really great. That's a very analytical approach to take to looking at your your inventory a good starting point is to pick a business that you really like that you really see that's doing volume because you don't know what their profitability are is you don't know the real story about their finances you're just noticing that they seem to be doing a lot of volume there's a lot of traffic product is moving you could say this is my starting point mm -hmm. uh, so you're not really flying blind there's uh, there are a lot of places to copy and say okay this is a great reference point of First and foremost, it's not the SKUs that you're picking. It's the categories. The categories are determined by long before the store ever opens in terms of what is our business model. You can't just add a category or think that a category is inclusive with other categories. What do I mean by that? Juice in a bottle is a category. Smoothies are a category. Uh, pastries is a category. Coffee. Coffee is a category. Made to order juice. Separate category? Uh, Made-to-order made to juice, it's a, it has to be in the logic that I'm placing. It's definitely a category, mm -hmm. but we'll say it's a subcategory of how you're selling juice is the category, and then you have two, two SKUs, two methods of delivering it. So to keep it simple, I would just say juice is a category. And if you're cold-pressing juice, putting it in a bottle, that's category A, and if you're making it to order, it's category B. But I would keep them under the same category because the sale, the, the overall marketing, the imagery, your buying, your your methodologies, they're going to be along the same lines. It's not a completely different category. And that also means that your customer is going to just either come in and say, I want juice in a bottle or I want juice uh, made to order. They wanted that category. Mm -hmm. It's how they wanted to be served. Whereas having an ice cream machine, it's a totally separate category. The people that might want ice cream may never touch juice and vice versa. So you have to know your categories. And the categories really have to be thought out is how do they affect the business model? If you have a juice bar that has 17 categories, you're no matter what you're doing, you're making training more complicated. You need more space. There's more machines, which means there's more maintenance. There's more things that can go wrong. You need more storage for the, the uh, products, the ingredients. Then you have to have more operators. If people are standing online and they're waiting to pay $30 worth of juice that they took out of the refrigerator and that's all they want, they might be on a long line waiting for somebody uh, who just ordered an espresso and the, the technician, sorry, the the rep is making an espresso. They're not available to work the mm -hmm. register. Now speed of service becomes a problem in a grab-and-go business or in any model today. People are moving very fast. So you have to see how your categories, what the implication it is on to labor and the overall flow of what you have going on there. I see right away when a business has too many categories and too much labor and it's not worth the effort. Mm. And I'll say for sure, Juice Press, um, I believe that Juice Press did not open with too many categories. We had, I had, I believe, five or six fundamental categories and I didn't have the room to do the other things that I would have done if I had the room, which would have been a fatal disaster. Mm. I, I wanted to do coffee. I wanted to have cooked food. I didn't have the room. Thank God, because yeah. those categories, first of all, they're not necessarily profitable, mm -hmm. and they're just more problems. And what ends up happening in, in retail businesses, I see this a lot, especially in food, is retail owners start getting married to their categories and their products because they have an impression. They're like, oh, well, I've got to sell wheatgrass because everybody wants wheatgrass. Right. 
And it's a quintessential uh, juice bar item. But when they look at it closely, they say, wait a second, I, I'm trading an $11 bottle of juice for a $2 habit. Takes me five, six minutes to make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, I'm not, the margin is horrible. The staff are tied up making wheatgrass. And uh, I'm selling six of these a day. Mm. I'm taking in $12. And so we get attached to those type of items. And we wake up in a juice bar. We've got 19 things like that that are not making any money. And they tie up our staff. And they're actually hurting the, they're hurting the business because the numbers are showing that the consumer wants the bottle juice or they want the raw desserts or they want something else, a smoothie. And we're saying, no, we're going to take a lot of time to make wheatgrass that, was, that we're making $12 because we want to please every single customer right. on the planet Earth. You can't possibly do that. Mm-hmm. So there's a reality component. And one of the things that I did at Juice Press was I asked uh, the master, I said, what is it so valuable about wheatgrass that everybody wants? And he said, uh, they want the chlorophyll. I said, isn't there another way? And I went to the E3 Live product mm-hmm. and I said, let me make E3 Live shots because it's different. It's weird. It takes two and a half seconds to serve it. I could uh, have a regular margin on it. I don't have a machine to clean. It worked. Mm-hmm. And it got rid of the, the wheatgrass problem in that particular business. So you can't build your business around having 25 loss leader items. Right. If you know that term, loss leader. Yeah, it brings them into the store, but right. you don't make money on it. You can't do it. You got to be very, right. very sharp about what type of loss leaders you sell in a business and make sure that your loss leaders are not competing with your primary business. Mm. So if they're buying wheatgrass instead of a juice, now it's competing it's gonna, with Of course their, it's going to happen. Yeah. Of course. Mm-hmm. Consumers, you you teach them how to shop in your yeah. store, especially if they love the space, they love your face, they love the brand. Everybody's doing juicing. They're just coming to be a part of the project. You train them how to shop. Hmm. It's it's how you set up your store. You got to pay attention. There's, there's, there's so many simple logics. Like, for example, if you put shots in a refrigerator with $9, $10, $11 juices, the newbie who doesn't want to spend $11, of course, they're going to buy the shot. Hmm. You cannibalize your business. So the shots probably are better as a point of sale item after as, somebody- as an add-on product. Right. Yeah. And that, and that requires a business model and that requires planning mm. to figure that out. And, and so, uh, you know, that has to go into the design component of the store. How will you refrigerate those shots at the, count, the, at the counter? And you, you really do have to understand, and I think I'm the only human being that has sufficient writing on this. What's taking place at the counter? That's the holy grail. Mm -hmm. How you set up your counter is everything to the business in a business that has a counter. Right. If it's a business that doesn't have a counter, it's a totally different animal altogether. Grocery stores definitely figured that out a while ago. Some of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, pharmacies are a better example. Mm. Grocery stores, what I have seen is by the big ones, by the time I'm at the counter... The only nonsense I'm buying, if I'm buying anything, is a pack of gum, which is one in a million. Uh, yes, the magazines are something, and all those extra items, they actually are extremely profitable. People are less price sensitive. But I would say you don't want to have that type of counter in a juice bar. It, it looks messy. Right. And you don't, you, you know, having magazines, again, another category, but it doesn't necessarily fit into a single store business model, and it doesn't necessarily make any sense. So what you're really thinking about at the counter is you're trying to innovate the two or three products that are extremely profitable, very unique, very well branded to your name that people just pick up as a reflex because it's just that good. Mm. If it's not moving, you didn't hit, you didn't score the touchdown. You have to get rid of that item and come up with the next item. In you know, I, I hate to admit it, but raw chocolates not being necessarily a health food, nothing wrong with them. To a degree, it's not necessarily a juice product, but you would say that a five dollar, a four dollar raw chocolate is a great accessory to any purchase. People will throw one in their bag; they'll mm-hmm. have it later. They'll bring it home to their wife, or right. you know. So you have to really figure out for your neighborhood, for your town, what is the magic skew that belongs at the counter. It's not going to be lifesavers, mm-hmm. which a lot of juice bars do. They they just say, oh. Kind bar, that makes sense. Mm. What that tells me right away is that the owner is doing two things. One, they don't really have a nutrition paradigm in their head. So they're just a juice bar at that point. 
no offense, and I'm not trying to be like inflammatory. The other thing it tells me is that um, they're pandering to the guest completely. They're mm-hmm. basically saying, I think my customers want this kind of mm-hmm. I better have it here. They're not really thinking it through. Um, and if you look at the overall numbers, that, and by the way, I'm not attacking kind, very nice people. I'm sure it's a great product. Um, I'm just talking about it in the context of a juice bar and a premium product. Um, if you look at your dollars and cents that you're taking in on that stuff, you're not building a beach house with it. Mm-hmm. It's not really supporting the business. It's a waste of space mm. for a product that should be there that moves you towards your end goal. The counter is the place where you develop your own branded products. You don't spend all that time and effort and, and put your, your life on the line opening a store to promote other people's products right. for free. It's different. If Kind Bar wants to give me 300000 a year, I'll make a beautiful display in my store for them. Mm-hmm. And I mean that, I don't mean that in a jerky way. I mean like the nature of retail is ridiculous that a person would handcraft mm. all that product and be in business and then give but somebody a, and, and generate traffic kind of, yeah. and then give someone else the benefit of that. Right. And and still pay for it and make shitty margin. That makes sense. So if that's the business model, I'm out. Right. I don't like that business model. Um, it's too difficult in the beginning for a lot of people to have uh, branded products mm-hmm. amongst the thing they're doing uh, so there is a way around it you know you find brands that will that will um, co-brand right. with you that they'll have their brand and your brand on the label that's that's a, that's a starting point um, and if you have to sell ready-made packaged goods just remember you're competing with Whole Foods mm. you can't have an energy bar on your counter for five dollars because that's your 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 markup is a certain thing. You're following a, a a a business plan, but that product can be bought at Whole Foods for much less because, you know, the difference is if if I know that Marcus has that bar for five dollars, but I go to Whole Foods and it's three twenty nine, the consumer then just has it in your mind that you're, you're too expensive. Mm-hmm. So you're you're hurting your business. So if you if you need that product there just to make people happy and fill space fill space. Just accept that your extra dollar fifty in profit is not doing anything for you, so you might as well sell it for cost mm. for three twenty nine. It's a placeholder because you're going to come back and later on you're going to make your own energy bar, and you're going to sell it, and you'll be the only one that has it, and you could sell it for what you need to sell it for. And people are taking your wrapper, they're taking your brand, putting it in their bag, and they have it in their home, and they're reminding themselves where they shop. Right. Hallelujah. And that's a unique item that they can only get from your place. And you, 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 You're building a brand. Mm-hmm. Because what's your exit strategy? My exit strategy at Juice Press was to sell it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not just selling a juice that I have. I'm not, you're not going to sell your business for the inventory you have in your refrigerators. You're selling it for the revenue and you're selling it for the operation, for your locations, and for the brand. The, 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 the buyer of your business has an impression of what your brand means to a marketplace. So if you're not building a brand, what are you doing? You're saying, oh, I want to run my business for cash. Some people never want to sell. They want a family-owned business. They want to keep it forever. Right. So that's a different mentality. That's in your business plan. You wouldn't be as eccentric about building a brand because you're not going to sell a brand. But at the same time, you recognize you're in a competitive market. So you need every trick in the book, so to speak, not in an evil way, just every trick in the book to make sure that the consumer at large wants to buy into your brand. Mm-hmm. And branding is a massive topic, by the way. So, uh, yeah, that could be a whole two-hour podcast. It's a itself. lot. It's a lot. Um, have you ever? My brother wanted me to ask you this question. Have you ever gotten really excited about a new product you're releasing and it totally flopped and surprised you? Uh, I would say seventy-five percent of the the products that I invented had flopped. Okay. And the percentage rate of the of the ones that stuck are high enough to make a good business. Mm. So you, you go into it knowing that it's a high failure proposition in the innovation department. Right. So uh, with that in mind It's more like experimenting. You have to experiment. There's mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of different factors. I think that the thing that we should talk about in twenty twenty is what should a juice bar in a particular city look like? It's a very difficult business. I think that that um, you first have to really 
say, okay, what's my exit strategy? I think in 2020, anybody with a cell phone's ex- ex- exit strategy is they want to be Elon Musk or they want to get a billion dollars. They want to be the guy that started Uber. Mm-hmm. So assuming that that's what most people's strategy is, they have to really figure out the smartest way to get there and recognize, realistically speaking, by doing research, it's a six to 10 year journey. I want people to be aware that the juice industry as a whole has taken a dip. And there could be thousands of reasons. The obvious reasons that we understand is that the price point is still not low. Mm -hmm. And after a while, when there was a big trend and a big surge, the bubble popped because I guess people, maybe they're not feeling the results that we promised. Mm -hmm. And so now they're looking at the performance of their dollars uh, based on calories. I spend $11, I get 200 calories from a juice, I'm still hungry. Mm-hmm. Not everybody can spend $25 on a meal at lunch every day. Mm-hmm. So the, the value proposition has become more real for people. So a juice business has to recognize that there has to be, there has to be a calorie proposition in their business. They have to come up with the categories that can also deliver categories for the price. They have to know what, the, you know, what do you spend if you go to Chipotle? 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 Chipotle. Chipotle. Chipotle, sorry. <laughs> you spend, what, 13 bucks? Mm-hmm. Okay, you're definitely full. Mm-hmm. There's yeah, no doubt. sure. Okay, so one would say that if the mainstream customer is going to spend $13, they want to be full. Of course, in the juice business that we talk about, the bottle business, your customer might be spending $20. Maybe they're buying two of something. But we still have to provide them with something that makes them feel full. The other thing is we have to know how to promise a specific result. Mm -hmm. Because unlike Chipotle, the the only two things I can think of that people want is they want it to taste good and they want to feel full. Like that's the consumer's mm. thought process. In in the juice and smoothie business and the health food business, people are expecting a result. They want to feel better or they want to see a result. I'm drinking lots of juice. I better be able to lift more weight, lose weight, uh, run, up these, run up a flight of stairs, et cetera, whatever yeah. the million things that people uh, think about this category. So it's up to the juice bar owner to educate his consumer or her consumer. It can't be left up to the cashier or the or the smoothie maker, and it can't be left up to the 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 buzz that's going around in the newspapers about juice. The owner has to convert the guest on a one-on-one basis as best as they can to get the consumer to buy into the uh, the category as a whole. And one of the tactics that I used was I distracted people from thinking about juice, smoothies, and the type of food we were selling. And I made a bigger point of saying, avoid processed food, and that this was the way to do that. Use this food Mm -hmm. and avoid processed food. I didn't go into all the health benefits of a juice. I always found that to be very corny, predictable, and cheesy, that juice bars would have names You know, and they would state what it was good for. And I would laugh because it's so abstract and unscientific that it kind of made fun of our industry. Mm -hmm. Um, And it didn't really give us the uh, lift that we need because in the background, medical people or people that are um, involved in anything to do with science, they're making fun of our industry. They're not supporting it. But it's, I don't think there's anybody in the health and wellness industry outside of the food business that would argue that a person should avoid processed food and then say, yeah, okay, if you're going to do that kind of food, it's better. Mm-hmm. That's a good starting point. So what would you say your main branding message is for Juice Press? Well, <clears throat> for New York City, the main branding message is that um, drinking juice isn't corny and it's not... Um, it's not camp counselor with a guitar singing a song to go to sleep at night. It's Juice Press, I think we, I tried to fashion it as being really edgy and cool without being deliberate. It was just a product of me. If you look at the decoration and the postcards, they look like my tattoos and my arms, mm-hmm. and, they, and they actually just sound like me. So I wasn't trying to be anything else but myself, but I would say that it was something that worked in the East Village. And I look at the customer base... Uh, it reminds me of Nike because we have the skateboarder holding a juice and they're generally broke. And you have uh, the billionaire uh, mom who's filling up an ice cooler to bring on the yacht for the weekend. Such a range of 
customer base, I think that it, it had mass appeal. And it wasn't a deliberate planning. It wasn't like I went to a firm and said, okay, I want to be a juice bar. And I don't know that that works for every operation that you just say, I'm going to be like juice press because mm -hmm. it has to be, um, it has to be sincere. It has to be authentic. It has to be something that you can support. Mm -hmm. Like in your mind, you, if you only understand the visual of a brand and you're copying it at some point in your marketing message, you're going to be inconsistent because you don't really understand the total ethos of that brand. So branding is another 15 podcasts, not of me, but of people that talk about branding. You have to open your mind. You have to look at brand books. You have to read stories about companies like Apple and Nike, specifically on the topic of how those people, they're just people, how they got lucky and created a brand. It, after the fact, it looks like everybody was a genius. They knew exactly what they were doing. But there's a lot of luck involved of course, with, yeah. with building a brand. A lot of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to pee real quick. You can't say that. <laughs> I think we have to pause. Oh, you're going to cut that out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I got to take a dump. <laughs> All right. Let's get into um, growth. Like when you want to expand from one location. We're back from a powder room break, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if anyone's interested. Yes, I had to tinkle. Oh, nice. Um, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's good branding. What? Tinkling on the air? No, when you announce that you have to think, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know your consumer. I would imagine that you probably don't talk about that. You don't talk like that in real life. What? I have do to you, pee? Do you say I have to tinkle? No, no, no. no. Okay. No, that that was that was for the bots. Oh, we were podcast. just talking about branding, so I would say that that's off brand. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about growth, including... All right. What what I'd like to to hear your thoughts on is knowing when you're ready to grow, like maybe what kind of questions you should ask yourself, and then I'd like to get into like bringing in investors and having the money to grow. Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, I could talk from experience that <clears throat> in the two businesses that I started on my own, I definitely didn't know how to grow, and I definitely took ridiculous risks. It was very abstract process, and it was just that I come from a system of thinking where growth was inevitable and it was always the goal. So I had that genetic imprint in my mind. So I was always ready to go. Mm. Uh, making it a more methodical process, there's two ways to look at growth. One is you need emergency capital because you're out there and you're drowning and you're not making it, but you have a decent concept, but it needs, it needs a lifesaver. So why I call it growth is because it is growth. If you found someone to help you financially and with infrastructure, there's going to be growth. Um, and so that's kind of where a lot of people develop the itch to go grow is they need help because they're not doing as well as they'd like to. The other time to grow is you're just on fire, right? You're, you're, you're you're making money. You're you're doing fantastic. Your planning and your preparation are paying off. Your store is doing revenue. You you may be breaking even or even making uh, uh, the the margins that you had planned for. And so now you're ready to say to yourself, "Look, we got a great operation. We have a great team. You know, obviously it's always a work in progress. You, you'll never be finished with the project. That's a mistake that people make. There's always something to be done. There's always a new problem. It never is static. It's dynamic like your life and working on your character. But you could say is we have the right series of problems solved. Like we know how we're going to hire. We know how much we're going to pay. We know what SKU sell. We know what customers want. We like our location. We know our design. We like our brand. Those things are... Uh, they're well on their way and you're ready to grow. So it starts off with writing. You know, you might even have a team now to help you, or you might go to an organization that helps you write a business plan that says, okay, here's what we're going to do next. I always recommend that people use their own money to go from one to two stores. It's the most, I believe it's the most dramatic. I'm not a math guy, but I think I could say that the most dramatic growth step is when you go from one to two, because there's no other transition store by store that feels quite the same. Because I feel like when you go to one to two, you figured out something awesome, which is how to have a, a multi-unit chain. And before you were just one. Once you, once you have two stores operating, 
to get to three is really easy. And then I feel like it slows down somewhere around 10, depending on the complexity of the business. Uh, some complexities involve having a commissary in the unit. And then that brings up the distribution and the oversight and the, the uh, safety plans and the standard operating procedures and different types of insurances and very complicated having a commissary in the model. At, at what point did you switch to the commissary model? Well, we had, uh, from the very beginning, we were operating our commissaries out of retail stores, so we never had enough space, and we were always behind. We always had, if we had more production capability, we would have done more sales. That was always mm -hmm. a very uh, exciting problem to have. So the first unit was producing everything for itself, and it grew too fast. So the second unit, we said, was going to uh, be the kitchen for production for the two units. And we were saying the perk here will be it'll do a couple of grand a day in sales, so it'll pay its own rent and its own space. Uh, what we weren't really clear on was that we'd have to create oversight for the second brand. So there's an expense. Mm -hmm. And then there'd have to be a small amount of distribution. We have to get product from one store to the other. So we had no plan for that. That was just stuff we were learning right there and then. We didn't really understand the business model. But we acted upon it. And when you do it that way, of course, there's a lot of waste. A lot of extra energy is exerted. And sometimes you get overwhelmed by your problems. You can't actually make it through. The business fails. I was lucky because I was in New York. I was in the right place at the right time. And I was a hustler. So at the second store, my father decided that he liked the juice retail business that I was in. And he said, sell me a franchise. So I agreed to do it. We made a very easy 10-page contract with him, and he opened a store in what was obviously a superior location to the East Village stores in terms of the volume and the demographic of the customer. His store, almost upon opening, was an $18,000 day store. Wow. It was overwhelming. Hmm. And that store was built right. He had enough space, and everything was right about that store, especially for that time. Uh, oh, yeah. And the way that we plan to open that store is when that store was ready to open, I was going to take all of the production team that we had downtown, move them to his store, and now they would be producing product for his store and our two stores downtown, right. and we would be paying him, buying the product from him, hmm. and, and, and he would be paying for the labor. And that worked out really well because his store opened with the best staff that we had. Hmm. And um, we just keep, we, we kept... Uh, playing hot potato when when we took back production and his store became independent we in our fifth store put our production facility for juice in that store and we had our food production facility in our second store and now we had refrigerated vans driving back and forth to the three stores and it was somewhat of a manageable problem because the distance between stores is not great and there's only three units in the chain and you're really only at that point really dealing with one or two drivers. Mm. We were we got an order to vacate, evict on the uh, fifth store that was the juice production because the volume was so high and it was in violation of our lease to have a mm. bottling facility that was manufacturing. And we were causing a lot of problems for the tenants that lived above. We had such massive amounts of garbage outside and we had to have three pickups a day and they, because of traffic, they had to stage them at nighttime. Uh, we didn't have enough space to store bottles. It was just really a disaster in that space. And we managed to do a tremendous amount of volume out of a very, very small space. But in, under the pressure of having to get out of there with the expansion at that point, we had I think we were at maybe 14 stores mm -hmm. when we had to leave. And we were in, intending to grow. What the obvious thing to do was to centralize production build out the right type of kitchen, get rid of all the storage problems, be able to have places to load trucks, to store trucks, to train people, to keep equipment. And so, of course, we went to a commissary model. And I have to say that I today highly disagree with that as a philosophy for this business. You think it should be per store? I just have, my personal experience is that you never quite reach the economies of scale that you believe you're going to when you get to a commissary unless you just have a lot of dollars behind you to build the kitchen right. the right way and to put into the infrastructure. There's too many factors working against us in the juice business. It's it's a very expensive product. 
Uh, overall, if you're doing a lot of volume, you need a tremendous amount of refrigeration space. If you're going to do it right and you're really big, you need different types of refrigeration for greens, for you know your your root vegetables. It, mm. it gets really complicated. If you're doing smoothies in the bottle or different products, then you need lots of freezer space because you're trying to buy right. You've got to buy a lot of something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of just storage for all the ancillary things that are part of having a business that's doing volume, you know, and then there's obviously this this infrastructure that has to be put into place, which you're not just going to drop it in place. It's going to take time to write out a HACCP plan specifically for your business and for the categories that you're producing to actually have robust SOPs, to have police monitoring the system, to have the right uh, theft and loss controls in place, security systems, break rooms, uh, benefits for the staff programs. It just gets really, really complicated very, very fast. And it becomes a very, very Overburden, overburdening aspect of the business. Now you're running a factory instead of a brand, a, a retail factory brand. with distribution. Mm -hmm. Distribution is extremely difficult, especially of a highly perishable item, which it invariably leads people to HPP their product. Right. Because it's very, it's it's next to an impossible math problem to allocate to stores and move around a product with a two to three. If you're lucky, some of the citrus things have a five-day shelf life. But moving product around with that type of shelf life, predictably with multi-units uh, in a chain, very, 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 very taxing on mm -hmm. the company to do that, to be precise and do that correctly. Are you familiar with the brand Clean Juice? They're a uh, USDA-certified organic chain. They're now up to 80 locations. Wow. I didn't know there was somebody out there. Yeah, they're based out of... Uh, Clean Juice. Based out of South Carolina. When did they start? Uh, 2013, I think they opened their first store, started franchising. Oh, their franchise. Yep. I like the franchise model. So now. so they, they have an X1 in every store and do all the juice production in the like house. That. Yeah. I like the action of that. I mm -hmm. think, uh, I don't, I, you know, I'd have to go look at the brand to really stare at it and say, oh, okay, I think they're doing it right. I mean... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things out there, you know, um, that are doing things mostly right, half right. You know, we could pick apart any brand. So I don't really, I've never looked at that brand. So I do think that the the produ the on-site production of the product is in alignment with the type of product that it is. So in other words, if you're going to buy sweatshirts and T-shirts, I don't think you're going to buy more or less because there's a guy sitting upstairs with a sewing machine making your sweatshirt. Right. But I definitely think there's, sorry, I definitely think there are product types that the way it's served and how it's created to production entice people to be excited. Mm -hmm. And I'm a vegan, as you know, but I would say one example of that is go to a clam bar. You know, the first thing that's exciting is it's usually by the dock. Mm -hmm. Great location for that kind of business. The second thing is you see a giant uh, ice chest filled with uh, those little those little creatures, and they're opening them right in front of you, it makes sense. Right, it gets Does you it, excited. It and, makes yeah. sense, right? And uh, I assure you, if you change that model to say that we shuck our clam, a great logo, by the way, we shuck our clams elsewhere. Can we write that down? <laughs> uh, why do I even know the terms? I don't need, I'm a vegan. Yeah. Um, if you were shucking clams, you know, 50 miles away, and they were coming in packages. Right. It's just a different kind of business. And you walked in, it's just a refrigerator of packages of shuck clams. Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, are these clams shuck freshly? <laughs> I like the word shuck. I feel like the juice business is a... I hate to say this. This is going to sound really lame. I'm just going to say it because nobody's listening. The juice business is a higher consciousness business in terms of consumers and what they like and what they go after. Hmm. When someone comes in to buy a juice, whether the juice is good or not is an irrelevant story. The, the person is thinking, I am doing something healthy, as opposed to when they go buy a clam. I don't think anyone says, I'm doing something healthy. I'm going to drink too much beer, and I'm going to eat these little snot rockets that have lots of bacteria on them. <laughs> I don't think that you're saying, this is my health component for the day. Right. There's an extra level when you're talking about a juice. Right. Yeah. So that type of customer, it seems even more consistent with the brand and the product that they would want to see what's going on. 
Right. So I love places that wash produce in a very organized and meticulous way right in front of the front of the guest where they can look in and see people juicing mm-hmm. and clean hands and clean uniforms and the uh, the right gloves and they could just look at the process and see a very meticulous process people eat first and foremost with that type of thinking the brain the thinking about okay what am i eating and when you're showing it to them i think there's a more potent placebo effect. I, I didn't really use that terminology here, but it is a term I use in retail. Is what's the placebo effect? What mm. placebo effect are we creating? If a person comes to a beautiful space and the staff are friendly and the brand is great and the product looks really exciting and you see the process, by the time the thing hits your mouth, you're, you're already in nirvana. Mm. So you have to create that. And the more we move towards the commissary model, the further away we're getting from that organic experience. My dream juice bar would be right here in New York if I had a beautiful hydroponic farm and we were pulling stuff out of the farm that day, putting it into a good nature product and serving it in a glass and saying, have a good day. Mm -hmm. I think that would be unbelievable. It's not cost, uh, it's cost, it's impossible to get lift Mm -hmm. but to me that would be the type of juice bar if i was opening one today because i think that it would be the most disruptive and the most difficult thing for anyone to compete with right for sure yeah if if you could actually figure it out i did figure it out it cost 31 million (laughs) dollars nice um okay let's touch on raising money well there's two ways to do that. One is you get a bunch of guns and you go out there and you do some blackmailing. <laughs> uh, you know, when a category is hot, it seems like that's what investors are focused on. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that food and beverage places are that hot. Right. They're always high risk. Uh, it seems like there'll be certain times when certain types of like, for example, like a Chipotle type business was the new rage and all the investor money was all pouring into the kind of well in that in that space it's the category it wasn't chipotle so to space it's the category that's good is that people recognize that they had a very good concept uh the revenue per square foot was very high the product was very easy to create Mm -hmm. low perishable all the numbers in the matrix make sense and now you can see that each store and unit whatever they had was making money when they go to a venture capital group or a big company comes and looks at them, they know they say this is extremely scalable. Here's how we're gonna. Here's how we're gonna do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are that's very desirable. And I wouldn't say that uh, the food and beverage business in general, though, I, I I don't think that it's the most alluring thing for venture capital groups. You know, so I guess there's uh, several different types of investors, right? There's, you know, the um, Family and friends, or you know, the the someone that you know that has a lot of money that likes your business, and they are thinking about it as a way of them making more money. Uh, you have um, private equity groups mm-hmm. that are they have standards, but they're much less stringent than venture capital groups, mm-hmm. and certainly much different than uh, groups that are directly related to banks. And um, you know, there's the other way to raise money is to borrow money from banks. And banks, I watched somebody go through a, a small loan recently. It's a, it's a long process and it's a worthwhile process. If you have the ability to mar- borrow money from small business loans, it's I think it's better to build, keep the business 100% to yourself and go off borrowed money to get to the point where you have more leverage when you go to the um, equity type groups that you're going to look at because – if you go to them in the very beginning and you're in trouble, it becomes a flea market. It's a discount. It's an emergency sale. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, getting, you're selling your company and you're selling your asset for 10 cents on the dollar just to get rescued. Mm-hmm. But a company that has – it's checking all the boxes that investors look at. It should be – it should be. you know, everybody's watched Shark Tank. So right. Shark Tank is actually a good thing to look at to see – how certain types of investors look at a business to place a value on it and what gets them excited um, and really study that and say, okay, this is a, this is actually a really educational program. It's a little ridiculous and condensed and they try to make some drama out of it. But the concept is basically, 
it's it's abbreviated in that show mm-hmm. for the sake of getting the show, but it is kind of how it works. There are for the type of investor you go to, like you know, you have Barbara Corcoran, you have Mark Cuban. The different they all have different criteria. What gets their eyes mm-hmm. wide open? What I've learned from my partner, he put it to me very in the perfect cliche. Any individual investor, what they're generally looking for is in your investment, they want it to rhyme with something that they made money with before right. or something that they know their friend made money with before. Mm-hmm. So you have to know your investor. What is their specialty? What do they invest in? If they've only invested in tech stocks, it's a very difficult uh, it's a difficult drive to get them to the point where they can understand what you're doing in a restaurant business unless they're just very brilliant. So it's usually better to go to people with experience in restaurant business. And, and just to be clear, you do see a juice bar as a restaurant, right? They're just terms, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, if you're going to look at it from 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 my perspective, you're in retail. Right. Your product is food. It doesn't make a difference if it's nail polish. It's just a different product, different rules, but it's the same concept. Anything that's dealing direct to the consumer, that's the retail business. So, retail food and beverage. You want to call it a restaurant. You want to call it uh, a F and B, whatever the name. Restaurants not the greatest name for a lot of people, but. I'm not going to get stuck on an, mm-hmm. the terminology. Is Juice Press a restaurant? Ultimately, yes, it's a restaurant. There's seats, there's food. Some of them have bathrooms. I, I, I guess a I, menu, it's a restaurant. I, I guess I just mean if you're approaching an investor, you would more likely go to a retail investor than like a F&B I don't, restaurant. I don't, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I would say that going to someone who's in food and beverage and hospitality, they're closer to what you're doing than just someone who's in retail and who owns lingerie shops. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's not afraid of the mess, because that's a big, right? That's a big point. Is that the food business is a lot messier than the clothing business? You know, you, in the in the, specifically, we should produce some of these videos. We should show people who are thinking about going into the food business what the actual mess looks like. Mm. What does a one hundred pound bag of pulp garbage look like times twelve? And like standing in a cold kitchen for. Six hours, like making. If that's juice, if that's yeah. if that's the type of kitchen you set up, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. it's it's a dirty business. There's there's floors to be cleaned every day. There's bathrooms to be scrubbed down. There's refrigerators to, to be taken apart. Freezers have to be pulled apart and cleaned. And uh, you know, there's just a lot of there's just a lot of messy elements. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, so we're talking about investors. Yep. Do you feel like I need to expand more on that? Business um, plan. You got to have a business plan. You work from the day you start your business. You should have a business plan, and it should be a routine that you write a certain amount in your business plan. As your business evolves and changes, you want to keep it up to date, so that as you start thinking about where you're going to find an investor, you have a more polished business plan when you need it, as opposed to trying to scramble one together in you know uh, a week or two weeks. Uh, you know. The business plan that I have, I've seen so many business plans. It's it's fascinating to me how I refuse to write one of those business plans. I know how to pull a 10-pager out to leave in someone's office so that they understand the concept. But to me, a business plan, like I said, is it's, it's a set of instructions. If you were to show me your business plan and it was extremely light, I'd be like, can I see the real one? Mm. And if you showed it to me and it was just really poorly written and I could tell that you don't know how to answer any of these questions – you don't know 10 important things about this business, I might say to you, look, I don't think you're the right guy for putting the operation together. I think certain components of this are a great idea, but to be honest with you, I don't think you're the right guy to lead it Mm. because you don't know that those things belong in the writing of that business. You're going in there as a cowboy, and the problem is you're going in there as a cowboy with someone else's money. Right. I was just going to say, it's fine if you want to do that with your own money. Yes. Figure it out like you did, right, right. in the beginning. That's right. But if you're asking other people to risk their money, you've got to have a little more uh, planning and detail That's right. It. I just want to segue and say that um, I think it's important that people understand that why I'm agreeing to do this is because I actually believe in the good nature products. To this day, Thank you. with the complexity of what Juice Press is, we still use stainless steel X1s and we have an X6. And we've I've played around and tried with pretty much everything that's out there. And I, I came to the conclusion that I need a company that's based in the United States as first and foremost with mostly every type of important machine that I, that I use because I need the service and the availability of parts. 
uh, and I need someone to yell at at normal times of the day. <laughs> um, and I think that when we look at what the Norwalk machine is, which is like the original cold press standard, the X1 is exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a larger scale, and you can bang on those machines for eight hours in a day. And yes, they're going to need maintenance. There's no machine that doesn't. The way we're blasting through those machines, there's certain things that we know that we're just going to break. It's a machine, right. and we're beating it to death the way you would beat up a race car. I learned how to use those machines by staring at them very carefully, and I made the modifications and the changes to the machines based on our production facility. I used to uh, complain about the mesh bags being expensive, and they... Um, without having really good supervision all the time, we would blow through those bags all the time. Mm -hmm. And then when I really looked at the problem very carefully, I realized that the issue wasn't just the destruction of an expensive bag too soon. It was also that I didn't think that they were sanitary enough. So I came up with a system in our kitchen that I thought was just absolutely perfect. I put that video on YouTube and I think that anybody that for, has an for, one, for cleaning the bags? You so, mean? so what I do with the bags is when they're, when they're done, we first have a system where obviously we want to get all that pulp off of them. Right. So we have a hose that's next to the X1. We have a drain in the floor. So they spray them down to get the big material out of it. And then they take the bag and they put the bag in a five-gallon like Home Depot type bucket. Right, I saw that, yeah. And then they, we, move that, oh, we move it away from production. It goes into a, a washing machine. Uh, it goes into a cleaning station. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we do is we soak all the bags. We rinse them in a sink that's designated just for those bags because I treat those bags as if they're actually food. Mm -hmm. So they, it can't be a sink that other utensils are being washed in. It's very specific. I wash them off to get more of the big material out of them. And then when they're adequately clean, I soak them overnight in a USDA organic uh, co correct dilution of a cleaning solution. I soak them overnight. And then when I'm done, we rinse them again to get that solution out of it. And then I put them in a commercial washing machine with no solution whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, a system where we hang them to dry. But in general, at our facility, the production is so rapid and so constant, there's really never any time in our facility that they need to hang and dry. Mm. Um, so they're, they're, they're getting pulled right from the washing machine. They're going right back into All oh, right, because then they're nice and clean after... Cleaner than yeah. any other method of cleaning that system. Right. To not put them through a commercial washing machine at the level that we're using, to me, is a, is a, it's, it's just not sanitary enough. Right. You know, I thought of in the kitchen, the way I write everything down, I treat everything as if it's a conta a con contaminated by something and I don't want it to contaminate something else. So even in how you hang the bags, the drip has to be falling into something that it, the drip of the water, even though it's clean, can't contaminate anything. Right. Because you never know what can get through your system. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that we're hanging the bag with it can't it can't be have contamination itself. Right. So I treat it sort of like a surgical procedure, surgery light, so to speak, because there's no way to have a sterile environment in, mm -hmm. in this type of kitchen and, and nor is it necessary. But you certainly want to have that if you think sterile to a certain degree, you're gonna you're going to end up with a much more sanitary uh food and beverage uh commissary than if you were just thinking like, how do we you know, just squeak by with the bare minimums. Yeah. So I'm excited to show you our new M1 machine. The, the little tabletop? Yeah, the small tabletop. I like tabletop. it a lot. Yeah. I watched the video. You got to get me one so I can try to break it. Yeah. Any chance of getting you up to Buffalo? <laughs> I'll come up there. I think that's not real environment. I think the way to test that machine is with the pressure of retail. I have a, mm. uh, a couple of people that I could put that right on top of the table and see. I, I For me to really believe in that machine, I, I know that you guys did not put out a machine that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So I'm not testing it to see if it works. Right. I want to test it to see what it feels like on a table. If it feels wrong and customers can't relate, it doesn't make a difference what the R&D is. So the way I looked at that machine, I do actually think it has it has the things that are needed mm -hmm. to make a customer go, that's a premium product. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to, also what I can't do in Buffalo is I can't get good at using the machine. Right. Because I'm going to be there for fear. one day. Yeah, yeah. So sure. th the real value for me in testing the machine is when I really create my own system and I can then say to you, like, if you watched us make smoothies in the very beginning, it took us nine minutes to make a smoothie. Mm. If you watch somebody who makes 300 smoothies a day at a juice press, 
mm-hmm. and they've been working for two years, it takes them 60 seconds and they mm-hmm. have three smoothies going at one time. Right. It's, they become like a blackjack dealer. It's a really <laughs> different thing. And that's what you have to base the system off is what happens when we ramp this up and we get good at it. Right. And they're moving in a certain way. Yeah, that's right. The workflow that's right. and everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Like when you see a real experienced barista, it's just like- I'm very interested in the, the machine that you have for 2020 going forward. I think I've been watching the products that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like a product that's too small and dinky will look like something the consumer could buy and keep at home. Right. And then why are they coming to my place and paying me mm-hmm. my profit? So I feel like the machine, I like the machine to look like something. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big guy for that type of performance. Uh, and I think that the difficulty in 2020 is consumers, certainly in big cities now, are starting to get annoyed with having of, of how much plastic they're using. Right. It's a reality that is finally starting to confront mm-hmm. the industry. We've seen it with the straws big time right. now. Yeah. And it's happened. It's happened in a dramatic way in New York, and I think it's a matter of time. You know, cities might be ahead or further behind i'm sure the cities where they're even more fanatic about this it's not the industry it's not new yorkers as a whole it's specifically to that elevated conscious person who's thinking about health at some point they're going to get healthy and at some point they're going to start thinking about other things like the type of straw we have or uh you know reducing that footprint but ultimately what you want to look at is is the plastic bottle really a business right is that something that's sustainable so i think that the people that will be innovative in this business are the ones who really get out there and try to figure out a way of serving this product that fits what this product is it's supposed to be extremely healthy it's the highest consciousness of eating Mm. other than fasting which is not a business by the way you can't have a business that you come in you give them ten dollars and they say enjoy your fast (laughs) yeah so the idea is that this is the purest form of retail food, the exchange is the highest. So it doesn't make sense to have anything in there, in, in my opinion, as we grow in this category. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do things that are not necessarily good for the environment. Right. I mean, I'm not even smart for saying that. It's just really obvious. Mm-hmm. What are we working on time? Woo! Oh, we're actually done. Is that it? You feel good about it? I want to ask one one more question. Right, go ahead. I'm going to make. I'm going to try to my best to. <laughs> We've seen juice served here. Uh, uh, go out of business. Juice, juice served nowhere. Yeah, juice served nowhere anymore. Organic, Everybody, organic Avenue, Liquid Area. Come on, man. Yeah, toughen so, up, man. Toughen up. This is a war, man. When, when that back door opened on that U boat, and half the soldiers on the ship got blown to pieces man <laughs> this is war out there okay so yeah. let's let's not let's not be squeamish because people went out of business look retail closes mm-hmm. retail is subject to an economy retail is subject to changes so what you do as a soldier on that u-boat to arm yourself besides get all the way in the back and hide behind three people and i mean that literally when in in re, in retail the 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 similarity to that is you don't have to pioneer everything. You could copy some people. You could hide behind other people's successes. But ultimately, what you have to do is you have to recognize that you have to have a tight operation. You've got to run a tight ship. It's a game of pennies, dollars. Mm-hmm. It's cents. That's mm-hmm. actually what you're dealing with. You're thinking about everything. How much does my bottle cost? If it was a high-margin business, in the alcohol business... They don't care how much the bottle costs. Right, of course. Because once they have the bottle and the brand, the content is worthless. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. So you've got to come in with guns blazing, with an extremely tight operation. You have to be the person who's willing to work the hardest, the most. And you've got to get a lot of things right, whether it's a juice business or a jewelry store or a cell phone company or a car wash. They go out of business all the time because people can't operate. Uh, You get unlucky. The consumer doesn't want the product. There could be all those things. You can't focus on that. You got to just focus in on what you know and what you want to do and how you're going to bring it to the consumer. People still want juice, my friend. They don't necessarily want it from everyone. They want it from the right person. Mm -hmm. Juice Press, I'm not going to take credit for why Juice Press is winning. It takes, it's a thousand elements. It's like a giant soup kettle that has dozens of ingredients in it that make it work. 
you know, um, and you can't rest on your laurels and say, ah, we're winning and we're going to win forever. That's not true. Big companies fail all the time. So you've got to stay on top of your P's and Q's, another stupid metaphor. Um, you got to stay on your game. You got to be on your A game. Every day in retail is a Monday. Mm-hmm. There's no weekends. There's no Fridays. There's no Thursdays. It's just a Monday. You wake up, there's problems. People don't want to work. They don't show up to work. They show up late. Customers are angry. Customers are happy. The toilet's broken. We can't get pineapples. The machine is broken. Uh, a dog peed on my, on, my, on my customer's knee. Whatever dumb things are coming up, it's going to happen that way every single day. And we can only improve our methods of operation from experience. But we should always expect new problems that we haven't solved before to arise. There are easier ways to make a living, and there are harder ways to make a living. And so I think this is kind of like the middle path. Like I would definitely say that um, working on a fishing boat in the Flemish Caps in the uh, in October is probably a much harder way to make mm-hmm. a living. And I would say um, being a uh, an oil tycoon. Is it a very easy business? I would say that somewhere, you know, in between these, you know, the food and beverage business fits in. It's not the hardest business in the world. It's certainly hard if it's failing. It's hard if you're a terrible operator. It's it's hard if your ambition far exceeds your cash in the pocket to do the things that you want to do. Um, I think it's a worthy business. I think the world needs more truly concerned health and wellness food brands that are doing the right thing. They're not making it up as they go along. They're saying, this is our paradigm. The biggest paradigm is no processed food, no processed ingredients. And I think USDA organic is actually very critical. I think it makes no sense to have, to be pouring juice into a bottle that's eh, possibly organic, not organic. It just doesn't, it's a, it doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. And the question is, does the consumer care in your market? And if they don't care, how can you make them care? How could you make them pay the difference? If you can't, you have a conflicting business paradigm in not being organic. It's inf- it's conflicting in you. What would you serve to your children? If you serve that same product to your customer, I think you're going to be better off in the long run. Mm. Hallelujah. <laughs> awesome, Marcus. It's a lot of fun. I hope we can do this again. And... Uh... I know I'm looking forward to seeing what you do next in your career. I'm opening a uh, weapons and munitions company. <laughs> I want to go into the death business now. I saw a, uh, I was watching on YouTube a company showing this, um, uh, like the revolving cannon that they put on battleships to shoot down missiles. Oh, okay. And it could shoot 4,500 bullets in one minute. Whoa. Armor piercing bullets. I said, I need to be in that business. I feel like I could really. <laughs> If I had one of those machines, like I could do, I could, I could make a lot of threats. I don't have to actually pull the trigger, but I feel like I'd have a lot of respect just by having that trailing behind my truck. Well, I'll be excited to see the postcards you make for that business. Okay. 